Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming today. Can everyone hear me? Am I clear? OK, great. Uh, my name is Matthew Sabellis. I'm the director of live and virtual events here at Education Week. And I want to welcome you to EdElect 2016. That's hashtag EdElect 2016. That'll be relevant in just a minute. I'm looking forward to having a great day with you guys all here because uh, you're going to all, for all of you with cell phones, you're going to be able to do two different things. And number one, what I'm hoping you'll do is silence them. So be sure to silence your, your cell phones, but keep them out. We want you to be using the hashtag edelect2016, taking photographs of the folks that you're uh, speaking with, the folks in the audience. You guys are as much experts here as the experts we've brought on stage here to be speaking with you today. We are hoping that you will be having a meaningful conversation because you'll be able to communicate who you're speaking with because of this postcard. Hopefully you all got this at registration. This postcard is going to walk you through who the, uh, what their Twitter handles are, who's speaking at what point. All of these uh, cards, again, are at the reg desk where you got your name tags. And if I have, uh, if there are any volunteers in here, if you could bring some of those postcards into the room, and folks who are raising their hand can get uh, postcards. So if th this will, again, tell you the uh, direction of the day and who's speaking on stage. You'll also see that on the screen behind. For those of you who are struggling with the Wi-Fi, this card will, that's your Wi-Fi instructions. But also on this postcard, it will tell you how to access the Wi-Fi in gross detail. I hope you'll enjoy that. It's a fun read. The bathrooms are located on the second floor. So those of you looking for the bathrooms, just go up the stairs to the second floor and walk over to the elevators, and you'll find the, the restrooms. During, we'll try to get to as much Q&A as possible. OK, we have, we have a volunteer with postcards, Tess. If anybody needs the postcard, just raise your hand, and Tess will get you that postcard. Thank you, Tess. Um, Again, a question and answer. So we have a, my microphone here in the center, you'll see. We're going to throw to the to questions roughly seven to 10 minutes at the, before the end of each panel. We hope you'll raise your questions. We will get to as many as we can. We can't promise we'll get to everyone. Then thank, I want to also take a moment here to thanks, thank everybody here at the Jack Morton Auditorium. This has been a great experience. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you so much, Danny, Mike. This has been a great morning. And, and we're really looking forward to getting this event kicked off and have a very successful afternoon with you all. So we're hoping for an engaging afternoon. Uh, now I'd like to, uh, well, let's get on with the day. Thank you so much, everyone. And good afternoon again. Uh, and welcome to the Education Week and GW, Graduate School of Education post election experience. This is not just an event. Uh, it will be an experience. I'm Michelle Givens, and I am the CEO uh, behind the nonprofit publisher of Education Week. And I would like to talk to you about two things, fake news and surprise. But first, let me congratulate you for being here, whether you are live here at Morton Auditorium or you're joining us uh, via the live stream. You have successfully navigated your way past fake news. <laughs> we, uh, we just came out of an election cycle in which false news was consumed as if true. Digital entrepreneurs discovered that we, the public, were eager for sensational stories. So maybe you remember the headline, Pope endorses Trump, not true. And Hillary sold weapons to ISIS, also not true. Of course, if, uh, if we go back in time, we know that sensationalism isn't new. Think yellow journalism. As uh, James Fallows, one of our keynoters today, suggested 20 years ago in his book, Breaking the News, the realms of entertainment and the realms of news were becoming uncomfortably close. What was news? This election cycle was the predominance of social media as primary 
distributors of our news. And the use of these platforms by questionable, sometimes foreign, websites to distribute false and often sensational news stories. This would not have been a big deal um, just four years ago or during the last election cycle. We know from a study of news trends by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism that the biggest change in social media, or the biggest change, excuse me, in digital media today is the use of social sites like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat to access news. In this country, 46% of us, almost half of us, rely on social media for some of our news. Uh, and that's doubled since just 2013, just a few short years ago. The same Reuters study also suggested that credible news brands, uh, think Education Week, are less recognized on social media. Only about one half of us notice news brands when we're consuming information on social media platforms. Uh, so when we're relying on social media for our news, it's often very difficult to tell where it's coming from. I read yesterday uh, that in the final three months of the US presidential election or campaign, the top performing fake election news stories on Facebook generated more engagement, it's more clicks, uh, more reading, than the top stories from major news outlets such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, Huffington Post, and NBC News. That's quite a statement. Uh, and this is, uh, this is from a BuzzFeed uh, news analysis. I think it's important at a time like this when we've elected leaders with different or even sometimes unknown philosophies and when there's a lot of uncertainty to be able to turn to reputable, informed, sources of information about what's happening and what it means, where reporters follow their investigations to wherever the facts lead. Uh, we think, of course we're a little biased, but we think there's no better resource than the reporters and editors of Education Week to make sense of the uncertainty in K-12 education. We've been independently covering the space for more than 35 years. Uh, before the election, we focused on the issues and not the horse races, and we continue to focus on the issues. Uh, and we report on them uh, via events like this, on edweek.org, via our partnership with PBS NewsHour, uh, and yes, even on uh, Facebook and Twitter, and let's not forget print. We are still publishing Education Week in print. Um, I also promised to talk to you about surprise. Immediately after the election, the Pew Research Center pulled a national sample of voters. There was one thing that most Trump and Clinton supporters shared, one thing. Surprise at the outcome. Overall, 73% of voters said they were surprised that President-elect Trump won. In more ways, than just this election cycle. Our world is more surprising than ever. We have to develop the skills to handle the change and the uncertainty and all the innovations, threats, and opportunities that are around us. Those of us who can embrace surprise are most likely to use it as an opportunity. Uh, and I'd like to think, uh, quite frankly, that's why we are here today. Certainly our goal at Education Week is to help improve public education by reporting on and explaining what's unfolding and what it might mean to those who depend on public education, which really is everybody. It's all of us in the United States, and especially how it will impact the success of students who deserve a good public education. We are looking for opportunity and change. So again, uh, welcome to today's event. We're uh, delighted that you're here. It's, uh, it's going to be a great ride ahead. And uh, at this point, I'm happy to turn the stage over to uh, our wonderful host, Dean Foyer, from uh, the GW Graduate School of Education. Thank you.
Thank you, Michelle. Pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, in case you didn't know in advance, I want to tell you that this is the original stage where Crossfire was produced. So uh, what better venue to consider the issues uh, that we're facing with regard to education and the future? I'm going to uh, follow along uh, Michelle's theme with the uh, concept of surprise and surprise my colleagues in particular by promising to be brief. Um, or as I think um, Jared Kushner said to Chris Christie, I won't keep you long. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me make four really quick points uh, in, in my few minutes up here. First, um, this uh, co-hosting with uh, our friends in Editorial Projects in Education and Education Week um, isn't coincidental, and it's not uh, just a simple matter of uh, somebody calling and saying, hey, do you want to do something with us? This is a, a reflection on uh, something that I, I believe deeply, two things actually. First, that Education Week is really the go-to source for credible, objective, independent, and reliable information about education uh, in the United States, in particular at the K-12 level. And uh, over those number of years that Michelle mentioned, uh, this organization has, has grown into something that those of us who are in this business uh, really can't start a day or a week uh, without. Um, so it's an honor for us to be able to partner with Ed Week uh, and with our uh, colleagues there on the editorial side and on the reporting side. Um, the related point is that these two institutions, George Washington University generally, our Graduate School of Education and Human Development, specifically at least for this afternoon, do share some very fundamental values, which is what makes this partnership uh, so important for us. First, we're all, both of us, both of these institutions are in this business uh, for the sake of the public good, by which we mean the production and interpretation and diffusion of knowledge that can serve the public interest. Uh, in the world of journalism, they go about that a little bit differently than in the halls of academe, but the underlying principles are really quite shared and in some sense similar. Um, if you think about the phrase public education, well, of course, that's what a lot of us in the graduate school here are thinking about all the time. Um, and if you think about a slightly different sort of punctuation of that phrase, the folks in Ed Week are thinking about how to educate the public. And so it's a different meaning of the phrase public education, but these things come together um, very nicely. Um, both institutions have an abiding uh, sort of commitment to the use of data, and I don't just mean quantitative data, I mean data as in information, as in uh, evidence, uh, as it relates to the complexities of education. And we are uh, in an era in which even the word partisan has taken on partisan <laughs> connotations. I would say we are multipartisan, neither nonpartisan nor bipartisan, we are multipartisan. And certainly it is true that the George Washington University, like many institutions of higher learning in the United States, um, is committed to the principles of objective, multipartisan uh, scholarship, teaching, and knowledge. So this uh, opportunity to share the stage with our friends in Ed Week is a blessing and we are very grateful. Um, I, I was going to, you know, just add that institutions are great, but it's the people in them that actually make the difference. And we've had the great pleasure of working uh, toward this event, toward this afternoon, with so, some of the, the finest and most talented people in the business uh, from the Ed Week side. Um, I just want to say a very special thank you to um, Elizabeth Rich, to Matthew Savellis, to Mark Bomster, and to the others in Ed Week with whom we have been able to uh, work and put this thing together. From our side at GW, it's thanks to the uh, 
literally tireless efforts of people on, on our staff in the ed school. Um, Turan Waters, our communications director, Tess Cannon, Jenny Akune, Meg Holland, and others who really uh, have been just uh, totally great on, on all of this. Um, my fourth point is actually something that I was kind of hoping that with all the sort of journalists in the room that I'd be able to give you a real scoop by saying that this election, the result was not what a lot of people expected. Now, how many of you have already gotten to that realization? Uh, but Michelle pointed that out, and uh, that is indeed what this is all about to a large extent. Um, the, among the consequences of the election, one was that many of the people who had signed up to participate in this forum had to rewrite all of their remarks uh, starting on November 9th, uh, which is, I suppose, a test of our agility and resilience and the capacity of um, our people to, um, okay, take, take the new reality and um, work with it. And that's what we're doing. Um, so it is a great pleasure to be able to have this event uh, here on our campus. Um, I know that um, my colleagues and bosses, President Steve Knapp and Provost Forrest Maltzman and others in the central administration wanted me to share their appreciation and their thanks to Ed Week and to all of you for being with us. And um, we're in for quite an interesting afternoon. Uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome to the stage uh, two people, one of them a member of the faculty of the School of Media and Public Affairs here at GW and an expert on American electoral politics, um, a professor in, our, in, in that program and the interim director um, of the uh, program in media, uh, Laura Brown, and with her uh, one of Ed Week's uh, finest correspondents, Lisa Stark. So please welcome Laura and Lisa, and we'll get into the first round. Thank you very much. Sorry, I went around the long way. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Lisa Stark with Education Week. And um, this is Dr. Laura Brown. She is an associate professor at GW and also the interim director of the Graduate School of Political Management. She's an author. She wrote, Jockeying for the American Presidency, the Political Opportunism of Aspirants. So I'd say that's a pretty good topic <laughs> for today. Um, she also has a background in education. She worked for the Education Department uh, under President Clinton. Uh, and so she, she might have some thoughts about that as well. And she describes herself as a flaming moderate. Um, so she and I are going to chat for about the next 20 minutes. And then we're going to open it up for questions. So you can be thinking while we're talking. There is a microphone right in the middle that you can come to if you have a question. And my only request is that if you could really make it a question. I know everyone likes to pontificate, but we would prefer questions. So um, I'm going to start by saying that uh, we were all surprised when we woke up on uh, the day after the election. And I'm going to ask Laura to read the tea leaves for us and tell me how we got here. Sure. So thank you, Lisa. Thank you to Ed Week and our Graduate School of Education and Human Development. This is a wonderful forum. And I'm so excited to get to be a part of this. So thank you for having me. I think the, the place to really start is actually to look much more deeply than where sort of the election returns kind of came out. I think when people ask me what is going on in our country, um, how do we end up with this result, uh, the first place to really start is to explain that there have been really three different changes or trends that have been going on um, for quite some time. Um, but they also kind of have different timelines, which make them, I think, rather interesting because they all kind of came together and crested at this moment. Um, on the one hand, my, my short answer to everyone is essentially that this election was the realization or the flourishing of the three most cynical messages that were all created in the aftermath 
of Vietnam and Watergate and were put into movie form in the 1970s. So the movie network, if you remember, um, everything was, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. The second message that came through was in the movie All the President's Men, which was about sort of Watergate and the uncovering of that. And that message was follow the money. And you can't trust the government. And you can't trust the government. <laughs> and the third um, movie was The Candidate with Robert Redford, which is what do we do now, right? Um, there is this moment in time where literally all of those cynical thoughts about politics, about Washington, about how essentially what we do here works um, kind of came together into a moment in which the entire country said, I'm mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore, and a pox on all of your houses. And so Bernie Sanders did rise in the primary, and Donald Trump did um, essentially claim the presidency, mostly on the power of them being against the system. So I think that's a really important piece. Let me just also say that there are the longer story is um, a much more complex one. I'm somebody who does study our entire scope of American history. I spend a lot of time trying to understand ideological change within the parties, coalitional change within the parties, how presidential aspirants um, play the role in reflecting these um, kind of deeper changes. And the book that I'm working on right now actually compares the Gilded Age, uh, which was a time frame from the 1870s. You can put it at 1872 or 1876, depending on how you want to think about it, leading up to about 1896. And I'm comparing that with our current time, what I'm calling the Global Age, which is really about this time frame from about 1992, essentially after the fall of the wall, uh, to now, 2016. And when you look at these two time frames, what you see is that there is tremendous restlessness in politics. Um, the two political parties go back and forth um, with quite a great deal of frequency. And the reason why is because neither party really has an answer to what is actually making the public so uncomfortable. And what is making the public so uncomfortable, both in that time and this time, is phenomenal change, economic change, economic transformation, massive dislocation of people. Um, you know, that time it was about us moving from agriculture to industry. This time it is about us moving from sort of industry into this digital global um, reality. And let me just say this one thing about that because I think it's so important. If you think about what an auto mechanics shop looks like today versus what it looked like just 25 years ago, you will have an understanding of what kinds of change we're talking about. Back 25 years ago, when you went into an auto mechanics shop, there was grease all over the floors. Everybody was like head to toe a mess. And usually there were a lot of parts everywhere. Nowadays, if you walk into the floor of an auto shop, it's pretty much clean, and your car, which is on a lift, is hooked up to a million computers. And no one is, in fact, really moving parts around, at least not in the same not kind initially. of mechanical way that we used to. And I think this is a huge part of the, the discomfort. We're being asked to change faster than human beings can comfortably change. Then there's a, a medium term factor, and that's that the American public has basically been pretty upset with both political parties since 2005. And each political party has decided when they got into power that the public wasn't really upset with Washington or what the parties were doing, they were just upset with the other party. So what we've essentially seen is that in 2005, the Republicans, which had control of everything, um, went toward passing policies that were in favor of their base. Then the Democrats, when they got control in 2008, moved to a whole bunch of policies that were in favor of their base. 
And the American public went, hello, we're not really voting for you. We're voting against the other side. So, so that brings us to today. And so that said, brings us to today. And you said, in, in a sense, the vote was a pox on both their houses. It wasn't Absolutely. really a Republican victory. It was, again, sort of voting against both parties in a way. Yes. So how, what happens now? We've and got the Trump administration. And how does it move forward on domestic issues? Right. What do you see? What do you see? as a possibility for this administration. Well, I mean, this is where I think what's so interesting is that there is the possibility right now, because both parties have been cast out in very kind of inglorious fashions over the last um, you know, decade, that perhaps both parties can, in fact, learn that the problem isn't just the other side. The problem is also within their own houses. And that maybe there's an opportunity to work together. We've heard that so many times. We I'm have. A, I'm a little cynical. I mean, I'd like to believe that you're correct. But what stars do you see that would align, that would allow these, the, them to work sure. together? I mean, I think the, the biggest alignment um, of stars is actually that I would argue that Paul Ryan is, in fact, even if you disagree with him on a whole host of issues, he is somebody who is a policy wonk, and he would much prefer to be a workhorse than a show horse. So that's, that's a good sign. The other side of it is, is that um, Chuck Schumer, who is now essentially going to be the minority leader in the Senate, mm -hmm. is a deal maker. And he is also somebody who's going to want to see things get done because 2018 doesn't set up any better for the Democrats if they obstruct than essentially uh, this year did for them. So I think one of the other issues is, is that both parties, since really Newt Gingrich won back Congress in 1994, they believed that obstruction would help them win back the majority. And the truth of the matter is, it has helped. They were able to basically obstruct. If you don't believe that the Democrats didn't obstruct in 2007 and 8 when they were in control of Congress and George W. Bush was in the White House, then you weren't really paying attention. It's um, a bipartisan It's uh, a bipartisan <laughs> problem. Both of them believe this is how they win the majority, how they get all of it. But the problem, but the thing is, is that now both parties have been burned by it. And the interesting part about both parties being burned by it is I do think they also realize that if they don't start producing some results, there's never going to be even a modicum of trust to, in fact, make your claims and win again. So where do you see, where, where do you see the policies that will be bipartisan? You say, OK, there are, there are some stars that are aligned so that people will work together. What are they most likely right. to work together on generally? And then let's turn to education a little bit. So I think generally, there is an opportunity, um, which a lot of people have talked about, on the infrastructure right. bill. I mean, I think that's where everyone sees that the Republicans would like to do sort of um, you know, a reduction in corporate tax rates. And with that, there would be a sort of one-time repatriation of dollars that are sitting overseas. And out of that would come about $240 billion is the estimate, um, which then essentially, certainly the Democrats, some Republicans, but definitely Donald Trump, would like to see spent on infrastructure. So there is an opportunity um, for something to move if essentially the House can be convinced that spending is not a bad thing. And they might be able to be convinced of that if they can reduce the corporate tax rates at the same time. All right, so we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Yeah. It, what about education? We have a very interesting dynamic set up with the new education secretary. Um, what, what is the significance of her pick, do you think? And where do you see education going under a Trump administration? Well, let me just say this is where Trump is actually very interesting um, so as, like, a, as a place Republican. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, if you, one of the things you might remember is back in one of the early debates, he was asked, and this was the primary debates, he was in fact asked, what do you think are the top three priorities for the president? 
And his first one was security and defense, which makes complete sense. That's what you would expect nearly all presidents to say as their first pick. His second pick was actually education, and his third was health care. Now, I don't know any other Republican who would have assumed that the president should be doing health care and education at the federal level. Well, I'm just saying. Well, he has also said that right. he believes the state should be in charge of it. And he does. Yeah. But, it is, but it is interesting that he actually even puts it on his priority list. Hmm. Many other Republicans would have argued that essentially it was something to do with the economy or something to do with setting the market, um, something to do with tax rates. I mean, it, it's so very what strange the that- do you think of him putting it on the list? I mean, not that you're in his head, I know, but I'm just wondering sure. if you have any idea about that. Well, I think what the interesting part is, what this actually suggests is at some level, I think Donald Trump is much more interested and has always been more interested in being, if you will, a more domestic president than a foreign policy president. I don't think he necessarily realizes that presidents, um, kind of by virtue of the Constitution, are much more engaged in foreign policy on a daily basis than our states, who do actually a huge um, portion of um, what we call police powers within political science, but it's education, welfare, right. and the health of its citizens. So it is interesting that Donald Trump somehow sort of thinks that being president means you get to be governor <laughs> for the country. Um, you know, and how and successful is he going to be at that? I mean, if well, like in the area of education, he's talked about you know a twenty billion dollar program for vouchers and school choice. Right. Uh, he's clearly picked an education secretary who's very much uh, believes in the marketplace, driving school Absolutely. change. Do you think they're going to be able to push forward that vision in any major way? You know, I'm not sure. I mean, this is where this is where we will see sort of whether interest and desire um, kind of you know is able to trump. Um, not to no pun intended, right use there. that <laughs> phrase, but to able to trump essentially institutions and inertia. Right. I mean, I do think we are in a very unique moment. It's not unique in our history, but it is unique in modern times. Um, I would also argue, though, that George W. Bush, he expected to be the governor of the country. I don't think he ever expected to be a war president. 9-11 completely uh, changed his agenda and also changed the power structure within the White House. Um, Dick Cheney was able to take on much more of sort of a lead role after 9-11 than I think he would have ever been had 9-11 not occurred. So this is where presidents never really get the presidency they want. Um, life and events and the world changes too much. But I do think um, if Donald Trump is able to essentially be more of a governor for the country and able to leave sort of more of the foreign policy to the generals, we'll see, um, then I think there could be some movement in education that may not be such a bad thing, right? Um, I think when I say that, what I mean is there may be some new energy and focus and interest in education that there hasn't been really since we have been at war. I'm going to open it up for questions in one second after I have one. So if you have a question, feel free to line up at the microphone. And if not, we'll just keep talking. Um, let me ask you, you know, education has become so politicized. Yes. And you talked about the fact that that's, to me, that that's one of the reasons you left education in a way. <laughs> you didn't like the fact that it was becoming so politicized. That's and, right. um, you know, a number of years ago, you had Republicans and Democrats agreeing on things like no child left behind. You had some standards and accountability. A lot of that has sort of shifted now. The pendulum has swung the other way. What do you, do you see areas where both sides can agree in this political environment, or do you think it's going to continue to be as fractured as it is today? Well, I mean, I do think it's fractured, and I do think it's politicized. And, and it is true that, I mean, when I look back to when I was serving in the Clinton administration, there was a massive middle that was very interested in 
essentially really making sure that we had higher quality K through 12 education all across this country. Um, you know, former speaker John Boehner was on you know, workforce and ed as the chair. Um, it, there was a bipartisan really that grew out of the Southern Governors Coalition that was so interested in moving education, which included George W. Bush, but also Bill Clinton, um, you know, former Secretary Dick Riley, who was my boss, and of course, former Governor of North Carolina, Jim Hunt. Those were all really leaders in um, talking about standards, accountability, education reform, making sure that, that essentially blue ribbon schools really were blue ribbon schools. Um, and, and this was really the, the impetus that led to No Child Left Behind. And what's so interesting to me about today's world is that while it has become politicized, I also see that politic politicization um, as being somewhat of a success of No Child Left Behind. Many people who worked on that hoped that what No Child Left Behind would do was essentially reveal many more of our issues in education than necessarily fix them. Part of the desire for some metrics were that when you started to look at the 16,000 school districts all across the country, you had no way to know who was doing well and who was doing poorly, or where we could target efforts and energy and funding. It gave us all this data, basically, and so to work it, with. it did gather and give us data. We may not be liking what we're seeing in the data, and some of the backlash, I think, is a part of that. And I also think there's been a um, horrible public affairs campaign um, against the idea of testing. Um, hmm. And, and so I also think that there's a misinformation about metrics that is also part of the problem. Um, and unfortunately, I would argue that, that that misinformation campaign was led by essentially a coalition of the far right and the far left. Um, oh, that, they came together on something, I guess, right? They <laughs> did. They didn't want to see any sort of um, higher standards for different reasons for different reasons right. let me I, I see someone at the microphone if you could identify yourself please and just yes. ask your question uh, I'm Susan Sclafani and I get my question is that in terms of what was said in the debates about education I took a lot of that to me not only education in the k-12 range but re-education for all of the the people who are so unhappy because they don't have jobs, and they don't have jobs because they don't have education. So do you think that he's going to put a focus on education and retraining for these people who have been left behind by globalization? It certainly would be my hope, because um, I do think that that's the only, that's the only real solution. Um, it's such a democratic solution, though, isn't it? I it mean, is. Republicans don't tend to like these work. I mean, as a whole, I know right. I'm being general. But this but is partly where Donald Trump is interesting. He's not really a Republican. Um, <laughs> and, and, I mean, he was a Democrat. He really he actually I mean, socializes with Democrats. And, well, but, and he also spent much of his time running for the Republican nomination by running against the Republican Party. Right. I mean, he did go against John McCain and George W. Bush and the war um, in Iraq. He did essentially argue that Republicans had been as much of the problem as the Democrats. So do you think, I mean, his, his, you know, his theme has been bring back manufacturing, which doesn't sound like a retraining no. um, agenda, but I'm wondering if you think maybe he would do something well, like that, or, or you think that I mean, both agenda? parties keep arguing this. Okay. This is, I think, the great salvo of both parties. They keep saying, we're going to recreate manufacturing in the United States. Um, you know, one of the things that's fascinating to me is nobody seems to be blaming Silicon Valley. When, if you actually look at what is happening in terms of job loss, it is because of automation and digitization, not because of foreign trade or you know um, other people sort of moving manufacturing just because of the world um, economy. So much of what we're talking about is, I mean, my understanding from the economists is that they said something like. 2% a year of jobs are lost to automation and digitization. And 
um, over the course of a decade, that's a lot, right? 10 times 2 is 20%. We've lost a lot of jobs. And we're going to continue to lose a, jo a lot of jobs. Um, the moment we have self-driving cars. Or trucks. Or trucks. Right. So, so this is where I would hope that we are. I mean, maybe the new retraining is everybody's going to have to learn to code. I don't know. But, but if that's the new um, basis for our economy, I think that that's going to be vitally important. And I, I imagine that, that whatever education policy you know, sort of goes forward, it's going to have to involve that. Um, you know, I think Josh Ernest said today or yesterday with regard to Donald Trump saving a thousand jobs, he said something to the effect of, well, Donald Trump will have to do that 804 times in the next year to essentially do what this administration has um, accomplished in terms of growth Job in growth. manufacturing jobs right. in the last year. So, so what we're really talking about is you can't just save what was. We have to prepare in advance for the new. We're going to do one more quick question and then wrap it up, because unfortunately, oh I know, we never have enough time. Um, go ahead. Yes, I'm Belinda Huang with the Higher Education Administration Program. And in that, you're speaking about Dr. Uh, Donald Trump being sort of more domestically involved. I'm wondering how you see his policies for education, not just No Child Left Behind, but things like the Pell Grant and those federal policies, or is he going to reach down into state policies and tell the states what to do? Because there is considerable chatter about California wanting to be the refuge um, right. as opposed to other states. So please come. Well, I mean, in terms of um, sanctuary sort of schooling or, or those types of, of bills. I mean, I do think that, I don't know if you saw the Wall Street Journal article uh, that was out yesterday talking about um, sort of the new GAO report that looked at student loan programs. Um, but it's, it appears to me, as I'm reading this, that the Republicans are going to be very focused on um, cost of education. I think they always have been. I also think there is a reality that when you look at sort of the, the federal student loan money that goes to each and every university, um, I cannot imagine Donald Trump not trying to use that as some sort of bargaining chip in whatever mm -hmm. policy he wants. So in other words, at some level, are universities going to be willing to risk their federal student loan dollars to not comply with another federal mandate? That is certainly something that I imagine is going to be on the table, will be discussed. I think education sort of has an assumption embedded in it that all that we do is always good, and it's OK that it keeps costing more. And as the parent of a college student, I kind of have to disagree. And, <laughs> and I mean, I just think that, that there is going to have to be some understanding of this. I mean, I yeah. spend all of my time as an interim director of a graduate school working with students and talking to them about how can we figure out to get somebody else to pay for your education, because I do not want you to take a student loan. I don't want you to do it. I want you to find a way to get a scholarship, to get your employer to pay for this work. I want you to work with us and with you to make sure that you don't walk out of the school with hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. So I mean, with that, I would just say I think this is something that we as an education community have to be committed to um, and have to be committed to thinking about how do we ensure the future of our students by ensuring that they aren't just in debt. And I'm just going to ask you to wrap it up, yeah. um, to look ahead. And, and I know that you have some thoughts on you know, kind of a kumbaya moment, how we should all come together here. And well, what do you think is the answer to sort so of move the country forward? I will tell you that the most disturbing piece of information to me that I have read probably in the last four or five years was um, a Pew study that basically said activist partisans are more fearful that um, somebody in their family will marry somebody from the other party 
than they are that that person would marry somebody from another race, another religion, another part of the country, or another country altogether. And when I saw that, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, so the look who's coming to dinner <laughs> is now the, oh, it's the other side. Um, and yet, what's so bizarre about that fact is when you actually look at political ideology in the United States, we haven't really changed. We have only slightly become more liberal overall as a country, but we are generally still a center-right country. And yet, the, the partisan labels and the partisanship um, has become so awful. I mean, one of my favorite statistics from Pew's study said that 70% of, of activist Democrats believe that Republicans are closed-minded. OK, most Democrats I know like to think of themselves as open-minded. Well, it's not very open-minded of you to believe that all Republicans are closed-minded. So here's the problem. Like Until we actually are willing to listen to each other as human beings, I just don't know how we're actually going to get out of this moment. And the kind of judgments about the rural-urban divide, about the educated, you know, not college-educated divide, about all of sort of the, the difficulties that different groups and different people are facing, I mean, at some level, we do have to realize that we are all in this together. And we can keep fighting each other, but the fights aren't really going to move us forward. So at some level, you have to take a lesson from all of your diplomacy classes, which is you start from the place of where do you agree instead of where you do disagree. All right, we're going to have to stop there, yep. which is a great place to stop. Thank you so much. You. That was wonderful. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you for listening, and we'll bring out the next panel. Hopefully this mic is live. Um, we are having uh, people who are looking for seats, so if there's a way that you might, anyone who's sitting on the aisles, if you're able to move inward a little, in a little from the ends, if, you're, if there's nobody too uh, close to you, if you can make a little room towards the aisles, we'll get more people seated. We appreciate that. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Kavita Cardoza, and um, I am delighted to be here with our government and politics team, Daryl Burnett, Alison Klein, and Andrew Ujifusa. Um, they write articles for the Politics K-12 blog and the State EdWatch blog, and together they're responsible for about 60 articles a month at least. So as we call them at EdWeek, our resident slackers. <laughs> Um, they are so busy working, I often don't get them get a chance to ask them questions. So there's you know, not a lot of around the water cooler conversation. So I thought of questions that I would want to ask if they stopped working. Um, what can we expect from a Trump administration? What's going to be different from previous administrations? So this is the first president that we've had since, I would say, the late 80s, right, with um, George H.W. Bush, who didn't come in with a clear, with a clear vision um, that we all know about on what they want to do on education. So we had, and we've seen kind of the federal role build over the last, in some ways, over the last four administrations. We had um, the summit in Charlottesville that George H.W. Bush put together. We had Bill Clinton and Goals 2000 putting in standards and tests. We had No Child Left Behind, and then the Obama administration's race to the top. Um, and now I feel like we're going to have a, a period where there's, there's already was going to be a big um, step back in the federal role in education because of the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, and we have a president who's talked a lot about school choice and how important um, he feels that is to the extent that he has talked about education. But in general, we just don't know a lot about where he stands on things like testing, um, accountability, uh, school funding. I mean, there's just a ton of unanswered questions. Yeah, I, I would also say, generally speaking, that you know we don't know where Trump might take an interest and become more proactive in a certain area. Um, in part because of the lack of record that we have. He might uh, take a, a big interest in uh, career and technical education, for example, and do something very proactive there and, and maybe displease some uh, members of the Republican Party. But 
Yeah, in, in, a, in, a lot of, uh, in a lot of ways, we just don't know. What does his um, choice for education secretary, Betsy DeVos, tell us? Any indication there, what we might see? So um, she has a, a long record of advocating um, for school choice vouchers, but also charter schools. Um, she's done a lot of work at the state level. We don't know a ton about her positions on things like testing and accountability, but we certainly know that um, school choice is really important to her. Um, Trump's main education proposal during the campaign was a $20 billion um, program that could be used for vouchers or other types of school choice. So the selection of Betsy DeVos means that um, he's really going to take that seriously, I think, um, and potentially go big on that. Um, but he also has a lot of, of other things, obviously, um, on his priority list. And we don't know exactly um, where education fits in all of that. We've concentrated a lot with the election about talking about um, the presidency. Dado, what does the political landscape look like at the state level? Yes, yeah, so this, with this last election, um, there are um, there Republicans hold about uh, 31 government, governor seats, um, and about 32 states are controlled by their both both their chambers are controlled by Republicans. So um, the Republicans swept um, a large swath of the country. Um, Obviously, with uh, ESSA, states will have a lot more say as to how they can shape their education policy. And a lot of state legislatures are very eager to get their hands on um, state, state, state ed policy. Obviously, they've been complaining for a long time that while they sort of share the large cost of uh, education, they don't get a lot of say as to sort of where they're spending that money. Um, so I, I, I would look toward um, the governor's state of the state addresses this year to kind of see where, um, especially how they, how they write their budgets, um, where they are going to invest. I've heard a lot that a lot of states are going to put their uh, education agendas, their prior education agendas back on the um, front burner. So um, it should be an interesting year next year. Is the breakdown approximately 10% of money comes from the feds and the rest state and local? Is that right? Yes, state and local. And okay. there's been a large push in last years for states to pick up even more cost. And I mean, if you, I don't know if anybody's ever looked at their uh, state, state budget, but it's a large portion of your taxes. And that's kind of putting it simply goes into K-12. It's a very, very expensive endeavor. Mm -hmm. What does that you mentioned um, ESSA, ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act. What can we <laughs> expect? Um, in general? Um, under a Trump administration? Mm -hmm. So I think that that is still a question hanging out there. Um, Mr. Trump didn't really bring up ESSA um, on the campaign trail, but I think that um, we can expect, first of all, that some of the Obama administration's more controversial regulations, um, including on a wonky spending provision known as supplement not supplant, and you're definitely an education nerd if you know um, what supplement not supplant is, um, but those regulations will likely be struck down um, by a Republican Congress. Um, there's also speculation, and we don't know for sure yet, um, that the department might, you know, be a little bit more, um, give states a little more leeway and flexibility in improving their plans. They're not, you know, if they just generally feel like they're headed in the right direction, um, they'll, they'll give them the okay, whereas it's possible that certainly the Obama administration and maybe a Clinton administration um, would have scrutinized certain sections of state plans a little more. So we already knew states were going to be leading, but now we know for sure. Um, with our Republican Congress and our Republican presidency that states um, are going to be where the action is on ed policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've seen, I've been covering uh, state politics for about a year now, and I jumped in at a really interesting time. Uh, the amount of activity that's happening um, between, um, between several factors within states, so governors, state boards of education, uh, state chiefs, um, there's been a lot of dialogue in states uh, through these sort of statewide tours on uh, engaging on what they want in their ESSA plans. A lot of conversation on what role testing should play, what does uh, success mean, what does a uh, high school diploma mean. Uh, there have been some very sort of, I mean, ESSA is one of the first uh, major federal legislation that actually requires input from both civil rights organizations, from, um, from legislatures and governors specifically. Uh, and so there's just a very public uh, conversation. I expect that conversation to sort of get even louder as the legislative session opens up. Um, several states have actually already completed drafts of their ESSA plans, and they plan on pushing it through the legislature in case any laws need to be changed or in case they need to sort of set aside some money. So it's, again, it'll be an interesting year next year. Um, we're going to start taking questions from the audience in a few minutes. So if you've got a question, please feel free to line up near the mic. 
um, and while we're, we're waiting um, for that, what about unions? It seems like unions, you know, I, I would get emails or mm -hmm. on Twitter see, you know, union activity all the time. And um, what's going to be their role now under the Trump administration? So I would say that they are going to have less power um, than they certainly would have under a Clinton administration. Um, they really went all in um, on Hillary Clinton, um, endorsed her really early. Um, you know, in, in that way, the leadership of the unions alienated some of their members who'd been hoping for a little more consideration for Bernie Sanders. And we should say, um, I think the results say one out of every three NEA members voted for uh, Trump, yeah. and one out of every five member, AFT members, yeah. voted for Trump. Okay. So, um, but that does mean that a, a third or a quarter of their membership um, is excited about, or at least on board with um, this presidency, so that maybe could give them an opening. However, they did put out very quickly um, very negative statements about um, Betsy DeVos, um, Trump's choice of an education secretary. So it would seem, you know, difficult um, to oppose somebody's confirmation and then work with them. Um, that, that'll put them in a tough position. Mm -hmm. uh, at the state level, I mean, these relationships are a little bit more complicated. Obviously, um, unions have lost a lot of bargaining rights in recent years, but legislatures do not want to upset teachers because there are so many of them. In a lot of areas, they're the school districts are the largest employers. Um, and obviously, ESSA allows for teachers to be at the table when they are creating state plans. So I've seen some very, um, some teacher activists that have, I mean, I, flew to Oklahoma this year to cover um, at least 40 teachers there actually ran for office. Um, you know, teachers are sort of very, they've sort of taken this anti-testing, um, anti-common core to heart. Um, they want to get much more politically engaged. Um, so what that means as far as, you know, the role of the unions take, whether they sort of lead this effort and co can coalesce that into an actual movement at the state house or kind of convince governors to ease up on, um, ease up on standards is sort of yet to be seen. Mm -hmm. Andrew, I, I know you had said that the, this year we've seen the Republicans and the unions kind of come together, and you've described that relationship at sometimes as frenemies. What are we going to see going forward? I don't think we entirely know the answer yet. I think there uh, could be some areas of common ground uh, for those two groups. For example, Allison mentioned uh, the Obama administration's proposed uh, rules for spending and, and federal government spending. Both sides want that tossed. They want that gone. But uh, I think it's important to remember that although there might be a few specific policy areas where they see eye to eye, especially in the early days of the Trump administration, there could be political dynamics that create a lot of disincentives for people on opposite sides to be seen as cooperating. And even though education isn't the highest profile issue, uh, that might make them more skittish about collaborating or working together, even on discrete policy issues. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I'm a student here, a doc student in special education. And I was wondering if you could read the tea leaves at all for how the new administration will deal with students with disabilities and also English language learners. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really good question. Um, in talking to some folks in the civil rights community, um, there's some concern based on a lot of the rhetoric um, that Mr. Trump used on the campaign trail, um, making fun of a disabled reporter, some of the things that he said um, about immigrants. Um, we don't know if that was just campaign trail rhetoric and how it will translate into policy. Um, and that's something I know that those, those groups will be closely watching. Um, as we've been talking about, um, one of our big themes has been a lot of the action is going to be on the state level. So I think that state, state civil rights advocates are really getting engaged with um, leaders, local leaders, um, their state education chiefs, and their governors to try to make sure those students are protected, at least under their um, plans for the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, in terms of just other federal policy, it's a really open question right now. Hi, I'm Nancy Kober with the Center on Education Policy. And Graduate School of Education here. Uh, one of the few things Trump said on the campaign trail was anti-Common Core, no more Common Core, which is very misleading because it was the states who make the decisions to adopt it. Uh, it's not necessarily the president can say no more. Um, so 
gathering that there's enough Republican support to do something, what can the federal government really do? Would they, do you think they'd have an anti-Common Core? I mean, would the federal government swing to the other way where they'd try to like come up with some sort of federal pronouncement to end the Common Core that states have already adopted and uh, by the studies we've done at the Center on Education Policy invested a great deal of time and effort and teachers and administrators and state uh, policy people invested a great deal of time and effort in getting it to the point where it's becoming implemented in classrooms. Um, and the, the new education secretary has said she's not a fan of the Common Core. So going forward, what does that mean? So that's a really good question. Um, the Every Student Succeeds Act includes um, a prohibition in it for, um, on the secretary from telling sta states which standards to use. Um, but also, the education secretary can't tell states which standards not to use. So there's really no way for a Trump administration, without reopening ESSA, yeah. to um, say you can't use the Common Core. Like, they wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but if you have a president and a secretary out there saying these standards are really bad, I mean, that's probably not awesome for them in terms of just, you know, the public perception um, and just the political rhetoric. Um, and certainly governors could decide to um, move away from those standards. A lot of states are revisiting their standards this year. That said, and I think Andrew um, has done a, a lot of reporting on this, most states right, um, kept, kept the, uh, may have changed the branding on the Common Core, but their standards really look a lot, uh, look very similar to, to the Common Core standards. If you want exactly. To say, well, yeah. I, I think that for the most part, uh, the standards have held up relatively well in states, at least in terms of you know, their adoptions and what states have done or not done with them. Um, but you know, as Allison said, the, the bully pulpit does matter to a certain extent, and maybe it will matter to some states who will say, well, it's time for us to review our standards anyway. Maybe they haven't been working particularly well in our state. Maybe a lot of people in my state don't like them. So maybe we should do something at least nominally different or substantively different. So, but in terms of the federal policy, Allison is exactly right. There's, there's pretty much no wiggle room for the federal government to say you have to get rid of the Common Core. Hi there. I'm Abby Weiss, and I'm with Jumpstart. We're a national early education organization, so you can probably guess my question. Um, <laughs> most of what we've heard about early education has really been about child care um, from the president-elect and about um, paid parental leave for mothers. Um, so I'm wondering, any guesses you have, tea leave reading, um, on what we can possibly expect in early ed and pre-K? Thanks. So this is probably one of the very few areas where there's at least some bipartisan interest. Um, I think the details are really TBD. Um, does anybody else have anything to add to that? But I, I think it's one of the few areas that you could see Democrats maybe lining up with the Trump administration. Yeah, I mean, you could see some, I, I think just yesterday, right, the, the Obama administration announced preschool development grants, and maybe you could see that. The, the future of that particular program is uncertain, I believe, but maybe you could see Republicans and Democrats lining up behind something similar. Uh, in Congress, uh, but yes, I, I think the future is uncertain for that particular area, at least at the federal level. Hi, Hi. Joel Packer, retired. Um, <laughs> um, I thought there'd be free food, that's why I came, but no. Um, <laughs> um, actually, two questions. One, um, another change that's going to happen that next year is there'll be a new chair of the House Education and the Workforce Committee. So John Klein is retiring. He cut a lot of bipartisan deals, ESSA, Child Care Development Block Grants, WIA, Head Start, et cetera. Virginia Fox is going to be the new chair. Curious what your thoughts are about what you see her role being. And the second question is, which relates to the, the previous one, what's your thoughts about funding? I mean, it seems to me there's going to be a big squeeze on funding, which is going to affect whether it's Head Start or Title I or all these other programs. So what's your reaction on either of those issues? Uh, so on John Klein and Virginia Fox first, um, Joel basically said half the answer I was going to give. So, um, <laughs> but that's okay. I didn't say anything about Virginia Fox. <laughs> but as for as for Virginia Fox, she does not she does not have I think the same reputation that that Klein has uh, had about in terms of cutting uh, 
bipartisan deals. I think Klein was moving bills out of his committee very late this year that had unanimous or near unanimous support, which many people used to watching Congress would find surprising, especially so close to an election. Virginia Fox has been involved um, in shepherding through workforce legislation, I believe, in 2014. So it's not as if she doesn't have some experience in that area, but she has also been very, like many Republicans, very outspoken against the Obama agenda. And she, when I spoke to her recently, she didn't have many kind things to say about um, what Hillary Clinton was pitching either. So it will be interesting to see how she handles, and this segues into your second question, uh, funding for the education department and, and programs like Title I and Title IV. In fact, somebody told me recently that you could see, in addition to a general budget squeeze, you could see a lot of competition uh, between uh, advocates okay. for funding for Title I and funding for Title IV, um, sort of fighting over the shrinking or relatively static pots of money that are available. Uh, so that's one possibility. Um, and one thing Joel didn't say is that he was the premier education funding um, advocate for a very long time. And we, we talked to him very, very often about um, these across the board cuts um, that are known as sequestration. Um, right now, Congress is going to have to, has been, there's been an elusive long term budget deal to alleviate those cuts. Um, and now that we have Republicans in charge of not only the White House, but also um, both houses of Congress, it seems pretty likely. Um, that there could be a long-term budget deal. And what Joel used to call NDD, which is <laughs> non-defense discretionary spending, almost as fun a, a wording as a supplement, not supplant. But th basically, that's the big part of the budget that includes education, healthcare, many domestic programs, um, would seem likely to be squeezed um, under, under a, just any sort of generic administration that's um, controlled by Republicans. That said, though, there are certain programs um, within the education department that Republicans have historically been big fans of. Um, one of them is special education, um, IDEA state grants. Um, and another is impact aid, which is money that goes out to um, military, military families, yes. um, yeah. Native American reservations. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Yes, hi. hi. I'm Emily Hanford, and I'm a reporter from American Public Media. And I'm curious, um, given what the election has revealed in terms of divides between urban and rural areas in the United States, I'm curious what stories or issues you think reporters and policymakers and researchers have been missing about what's going on in rural schools. I think that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, one of the things that I find very fascinating that's happening in rural areas is um, a lot of the problems that we have typically associated with urban areas, um, everything from drugs, uh, et cetera, uh, poverty issues, a lot of that is now seeping into rural areas. I was kind of surprised talking to an Iowa superintendent recently that a uh, rural county there is almost like 98% free and reduced lunch. Um, and this is sort of just sort of the, the downfall of the agricultural industry. And so what you're seeing is a lot of these uh, rural areas are starting to empty out, and that means that they're going to have to, similar to urban areas, start closing schools. Um, they're going to have to have budget cuts, laying off teachers, et cetera. Um, schoolhouses typically are, school districts are typically the largest employers in some of these areas, and so you're feeling a lot of um, pains there. And I think one of the things that I'm going to be looking at um, is as states are developing these um, their ESSA plans, sort of what sort of turnaround strategies are they going to be using in these rural areas? I mean, um, SIG grants uh, or student improvement grants, um, school improvement grants um, was very much sort of tailored toward the urban environment, um, but it's very difficult to fire an entire staff in a rural district or bring out a charter school into a rural district. So um, I think there's going to be some very interesting strategies as to how to sort of work with, um, work with um, district staff members, I think uh, state departments are going to sort of start taking on a lot of the roles as to uh, support supporting these districts. Um, but I think there are going to be some very sort of interesting stories in the coming years, as, as, especially since states are going to have more say in education policy. And just piggybacking on Daryl's point, I think one interesting thing to watch going forward will be, and many reporters are to a certain extent familiar with this dynamic, is how rural communities and schools react to any sort of uh, widespread voucherization, voucherizing, 
are either of those words, um, uh, of, of education and, and just if the federal government pushes really hard on that because, God bless, bless you. you. If you <laughs> if, for people who look at Texas, for example, um, many might be familiar there with the, for many years the legislature has been debating vouchers. You might think that Texas is a very conservative state. It would be friendly to vouchers, but uh, I think there are a thousand school districts in Texas, something like that. Many of them are the largest employers uh, in their cities or in their counties. So when you start talking to those folks back home about creating vouchers um, and potentially seeing it go big, it makes folks very nervous. And ultimately, I think that's a big reason why legislators have not been particularly keen to pick that up. So that will be one interesting thing to watch, I think. And I'll just say one more thing quickly. Um, I think career and technical education is definitely an area to keep your eye on. Um, we've had about a decade or so of kind of college for everybody, you know, post-secondary education for everybody, and a lot of school districts have been cutting or moving away from those programs. Um, and I think that under a Trump administration and a Republican Congress, we're likely to see um, a resurgence of at least focus on career and technical education. Let's take one, uh, one question before we wrap up. Hi, Luann McNair with the National Council of Teachers of English. Uh, Detroit parents have filed a lawsuit saying that their children have a fundamental right to literacy, and Michigan is saying no. Do you see this spreading to other states or becoming an issue at the federal level at all? I'm very fascinated with that lawsuit. Um, essentially, there are um, a group of parents there that are arguing that um, my kids are graduating from school and can't read. Isn't that a isn't that a violation of the Constitution? I mean, don't you guarantee? And in fact, in the language of the, the response from the state, they said, we have no obligation to teach you how to read, essentially. Um, but I think that this is an interesting sort of take on, sort of take on what we typically see in the courts and states, which is, you know, you're not giving us enough money. That's a much more difficult argument to make than um, these kids are not able to read. I mean, one of the things that um, a lot of school districts or a lot of parents have been buoyed by in recent years is sort of the uh, No Child Left Behind and this, this, um, this movement towards starting to track exactly where kids are. So states are adopting standards and then they're testing the kids as to where they are on standards. And parents are actually using, parents and districts are using this in the courtroom. So they basically are just using this as sort of a way to prove to states that you are violating our constitutional rights. So it, it'll be interesting in the next couple of years to see sort of, you know, how states respond to this. And if there are going to be other lawsuits in other states, I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, marginally the vast majority of funding lawsuits in states are relatively successful, um, you know, um, despite a few, but I think this is sort of a unique take. Okay. I think we're going to have to wrap up so we keep on, on schedule. Um, can we have a round of applause for our education week? Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so the bad news is you're stuck with me again. <laughs> the, the good news is we have these wonderful experts whose names and organizations and even Twitter handles I see you can Fantastic. see behind you. So I just want to get right into it so we have time for them to chat and more time for questions. So um, I, I just want to recast the, the question we started with in a little bit of a different way. Um, you know. As has been said, education was not uh, anywhere near the top of the totem pole during the election. And yet, after its result, you know, when I see conversations going on and people talking about it, it, it seems as though people are, are thinking about it in such a fundamentally different way in terms of what could happen and, and the types of issues that people are, are thinking about. So um, how much, even aside from policy, how much has the election impacted the way people are thinking about education, the issues that are sort of front of mind. How much has that changed? And I will let anybody start. I'm happy to start if you want to just either go down the row or have people kind of popcorn check. Sure. Um, so I actually think for, for the AFT, there are, um, there are a couple different reactions, right? I mean, part of it is when you're talking about the election writ large, we actually saw 
um, some significant victories locally and in some states. When you look at when you look at the messages sent in Georgia and Massachusetts, when you look at um, some of the school board races across the country, when you look at some of the local levy referenda um, being funded, I think you see a very different message happening locally of people being awake and investing in their schools and eager to support their schools. Uh, when, you, when you look at the last winter, um, the, the folks in the community coming together to support and expo expose what was happening in Detroit public schools and some of the conditions in Detroit schools and then really fight for some solutions that um, that our kids needed there. So there's there's one where I do think there are some things happening that we need to um, we need to reinforce, we need to encourage, um, and we need to support where they're happening. And then nationally, I think there is a um, you know there was a, a national narrative building up around uh, around community schools, uh, uh, around schools as you know the the heart of a lot of what kids deserved and the delivery of that. And I think we saw that come to a screeching halt, and that's where there's a lot of, there's a lot of what next happening. Mm -hmm. Sure. But when you look on the ground, uh, there's a lot of really good work. Liz, how do you see the role of schools changing in this uh, particular environment after the election? So I think one of the things that's really hard and important to keep in mind is how much schools have become the location for a lot of the hateful violence um, and intimidation and harassment that um, people are experiencing. And you know, the country is changing, the population of the country is changing, and our schools are more diverse than even our adult population. And I think um, what is most concerning about this election is rather than celebrating diversity and thinking about what great things there are to come for this country that, that brings people from all over the world who have all different um, religious perspectives, who um, diversity of identities, um, we saw uh, a normalization of some really, really awful ideas, um, white supremacy especially, but other things as well. And, we're seeing children bearing the brunt of that in their school, and that is, that is very, very concerning from our perspective. Um, what has not changed is the priorities of the civil and human rights community. Um, what has not changed is what children need in schools and what they deserve and what the law entitles them to. So um, from our perspective, we are gonna keep fighting with our partners um, to protect children from discrimination and to move forward on building an inclusive um, and diverse democracy. Um, we're all going to have to be more vigilant in a way that I think we weren't even before, and that's really, um, really concerning. Um, and we're going to have to do that work. But um, you know, one of the bright spots out of what is a really, really hard time for a lot of us in the civil and human rights community is the validation of the coalition model and bringing diverse people together. And that's what we're seeing within our our communities is the the unity among diverse communities and uh, um, an acknowledgement that an attack on one is an attack on all and a determination to stand together and fight against discrimination and intolerance. Sasha, Carissa, I could, uh, either of you can, can respond to this, but you know, I, I would imagine that maybe thanks in part to ESSA, um, and from the practitioner's perspective, maybe no matter who had been elected, um, the message might have been just carry on, we have a new policy environment, we know what we need to do. Um, is, that, is that your thinking right now, essentially? Uh, yeah, I, if you don't mind, I'll, I, I want to just piggyback on what Liz said about um, protecting kids. And mm -hmm. I think um, we saw a lot of our state chiefs and, and local um, superintendents come out and make a clear statement about that it wasn't okay for this to be happening in our schools. They stepped up to make sure that kids are protected. And that's a pretty fundamental thing for our state chiefs. Um, you know, you asked early on about the um, about what this election meant. I mean, our our states have been for over a year now been working on implementing ESSA. They've been doing stakeholder engagement. They've been in their communities. They've been working on what does this law look like and how are we going to implement it. So, um, at the end of the day, um, you know, election notwithstanding, that does change the game a little bit. It, the law is still the law, and implementing this is still important, and and we're still moving forward on that. We look forward to working with an administration to make sure that, you know, uh, we, we actually have uh, some, the law is enhanced in a way that states can implement the way they want to. We really appreciated that about the law in the first place, um, and we hope that that's the case for this administration. 
Sasha, does that sound right to you? Yeah, absolutely. I think just to echo Carissa's point, uh, you know, our, our members are excited about the possibilities of, the, of ESSA and what they can do and um, looking to January when they can have conversations with their state legislatures and their state boards to really uh, put this vision of more state and local control uh, into reality. And uh, I know that they understand the, the critical year ahead of them. 1718 is the first year they'll have an opportunity to implement this new law. And that's really what they're focused on, regardless of what Washington is focused on right now, because they have uh, an opportunity to just really have meaningful conversations with stakeholders about what is school quality in our state? What does that look like? Um, how should we be evaluating teacher, teachers? How uh, should we be judging uh, student achievement? So uh, that, that's really the, the crux of what our members are talking to me about. Let's chat about Betsy DeVos for a second. It took me a while to get the pronunciation <laughs> down, but I, I think I've got it. Betsy DeVos. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, I was thinking about her, her background. On the one hand, you could argue that with roughly two decades in sort of Republican mega donor circles mm -hmm. um, and her connections in the political world, she's sort of an establishment person. She's familiar to many Republicans <coughs> who've been around a long time. But in, in this, when we're talking about education policy, a lot of people are looking at her and saying her goal is to significantly change the system that we have. And that's maybe what she has the potential um, to do at the department. So sort of a maybe a radical change agent. Um, which side of that is resonating more with you? And, and where do you see you know, her biggest opportunities to do that? And maybe um, I would also ask what, what's sort of at the top of her to-do list at, at the department, or, or what should be, I guess. Well, I'll start. Um, I, I think there are, there are definitely a few. Th the approach we're going to take um, at the AFT is definitely one that we're assuming she will be as activist as she can be. Mm -hmm. right? So there are a couple things that are questions in that. Um, part of that is how much attention um, you know, her boss has to education in general, so how much bandwidth she may have there. But she's been very transparent about the fact that um, you know, she, ex like all of the money she has poured into uh, different elections, different ballot measures, et cetera, that she actually expects something from that. And so I, we have every assumption that she will take this opportunity and, and run as far and as fast as she can with it. And, and with that said, I think we've, well, you know, from what, from what we have seen, we, you know, of, of her support for for-profit charter schools in Michigan, for her support um, on private, on vouchers, um, so public dollars for private schools, I think we are we are going to see a, a, a we've already seen her priorities, mm -hmm. actually, and I think that we are we are assuming that she again she will move as fast and as far as she can, and um, and we're preparing for that and and we're we're exposing it as quickly as we can as well because that is it is going to be really damaging to our students. So I know you guys, especially you, Chris, have state plans on your mind, uh, your members. So um, how much flexibility are you expecting from a Trump education department uh, when it comes to what can be in those plans, uh, creativity and meeting requirements? Um, what, what, what are you hearing? What are you expecting from yeah, that? Well, you know, contrary to popular belief that states would just like all rules to go away, that's really not true. Um, you know, that boundaries and accountability and all those things are important, and, and there is a federal role in education. Um, you know, I think uh, as we think about the plans, we, we want to have some space to do what's best in a local context. I think we've seen that having a particular way in which to do something across a nation isn't necessarily the best way to get it done. And if we want to improve schools, if we want to continue to improve education for all kids, we've got to have a little bit of flexibility to do it right in, say, a rural context versus an urban context um, versus, you know, somewhere else. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think it comes in a lot of different forms, and, I, and we're very hopeful that that will continue to be the case, that we're able to expand a little bit in that way. Liz, I, I saw you give a thin smile. Liz, Liz smiles a lot in a lot of my <laughs> comments. No, I, I, you know, on this question of flexibility, I think um, it's always hard to think of flexibility as a policy value in and of itself, right? Um, we are, of course, concerned um, that there will be a failure to follow, to enforce the law as required under the Constitution. I mean, we're, we're actually, there is a law. 
that includes requirements, um, particularly condition for receipt of Title I funds, and we are concerned that those requirements not be enforced. I think it doesn't serve any of us to have an unpredictable environment where you don't know what the rules are and where there's an effort to rewrite. I mean, there's a lot in ESSA that we supported. There's a lot in ESSA that we didn't like, but it is, in fact, a law that we have. And I think it's, regardless of sort of where you fit in the constellation of people involved in education, you need to know what the rules of the game are and you need to know what it is um, is going to be expected. Um, our advocates need to know, I mean, the Department of Ed just put out an accountability regulation, which is not everything that we wanted, um, but you know, they made some trade-offs. It is something I think that we could probably all work with mm -hmm. and it needs to be continue to be in place so people know what they're dealing with. So advocates know what they're dealing with when they organize themselves and educators and administrators know what they're dealing with when they set about um, their responsibility in implementing the law. So I think that's going to become really important. I will say we're deeply concerned about enforcement around federal civil rights law in addition to things like ESSA. Um, we're incredibly concerned about consumer protections in higher education. That's been a really important point of progress for this administration is um, students who are being exploited by for-profit colleges and getting them the remedies that they're owed um, and preventing the situation in which they, they acquire a lot of debt for a meaningless degree or even if they don't, if they complete it all. So um, we are expecting robust enforcement. We're gonna continue to push for robust enforcement of ESSA and of IDEA for Pete's sake and of all of the nation's civil rights laws. So uh, on the Office for Civil Rights, uh, you know, the, the Obama administration has been very proactive in that area. Uh, and they're saying that their, their caseload has gone up in recent years. Uh, part of that may be a function of the public stance that they've taken towards issues like you know, transgender students' rights and, and, and sexual assault. I'm wondering if just the Trump administration and Trump himself, his comments about some of these issues might have a chilling effect and might cause fewer complaints to flow into that office. So if there could be sort of a, a reciprocal effect of maybe budget cutting in that area, but also people just not thinking that the Trump administration will respond very favorably to a lot of those uh, complaints. Any, any thoughts on that? Or is that going too far? Is that unfair? I think it's an interesting hypothesis. I, part of me also wonders if, um, just gauged on to what Liz alluded to, the, the number of hate crimes and incidents of discrimination we're seeing post-election on our K-12 and higher ed campuses, um, if, if part of the increase in um, in the Office of Civil Rights caseload is actually a hope people feel that there's a snowball's chance something will be done about mm -hmm. the complaint I lodge, right? That they're actually feeling like this is a, this is a receptive Office of Civil Rights. Mm -hmm. uh, because we are, you know, we've been working with the Southern Poverty Law Center for the last few weeks and we've, you know, we've lodged over 900 complaints collectively that we've seen and we know from, um, from our <coughs> conversations with leaders on college campuses and in K-12 settings, that those aren't even all the, like they're not all actually getting lodged. Like they're not mm -hmm. all getting filed. Oftentimes it's a college professor who says, you know what, I just tore down all of the posters that with swastikas on them on my way to class and I dumped them in a garbage and I, you know, and then I taught and I didn't have time to report it. Like we're experiencing some of that. And so I think what we may see is to, we, we may see a, a confidence in lodging complaints. Um, I would hope they would continue to use the Office of Civil Rights that way. I, I share the expectation that they will then act on those complaints with integrity. And I think you, you will see um, organizations um, such as LCCR or Southern Poverty Law Center or ACLU and others take on those complaints and, and fight, for, fight for rights as well. The other thing I'd add, Andrew, is that you know, I think the Office for Civil Rights has a lot of important functions, and so a remedy and complaints is one of them, but providing direction to educators who want their campuses to be non-discriminatory, inclusive places is an incredibly important function. And you know, this is the other thing we're hearing a lot is school leaders and district leaders who are saying, I don't want this to happen, what can I do? This happened, how do we heal? And I think that's the other thing we really need to see from an Office for Civil Rights is not just when, when a law has been broken, when a student has been discriminated against, is there, an, you know, is there appropriate action taken if the school or the district follow, fails to follow through on their responsibility, but for those school and district leaders who reach out proactively and ask for help and guidance, are they getting that? Or are they just meeting a Department of Education that refuses to engage and provide them the support they need to ensure students are protected from discrimination? 
if you have a question, you can mm -hmm. be the first at the microphone. So have your questions ready. Um, Sasha, can we switch gears a little bit, maybe talk Congress? So we've been focusing a lot on ESSA, but there's a lot, I think, on Congress's plate when it comes to education, um, including some things that got some traction in this session of Congress that's winding down that maybe a good candidates to get over the finish line. What, what are you hearing? What, what do you think is going to be at the top of the list when it comes to education? I think initially, the start of uh, next year's Congress, it's going to be more of looking back than looking forward. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's a lot of interest in moving the Higher Education Act reauthorization and the Perkins CTE Act uh, reauthorization. Uh, but I think that the focus for uh, Republicans, who are again in the majority in both chambers, is going to be looking back at regulations and, and guidance, too, probably, uh, that were issued under the Obama administration uh, and trying to rescind some of them using kind of a technical procedure called the Congressional Review Act, mm -hmm. which um, I think was started in 1996. I think that's when it was passed originally. It's only been used once, to my knowledge. Um, and it kind of allows them uh, kind of a fast track way of rescinding uh, regulations before they go into effect. So these are regulations that the Obama administration may have issued, just like Liz mentioned, the accountability ones uh, that just came out earlier this week, and, and ones that may come out in the next few weeks as well would fall under this as well. Um, in a manner that would ensure that they don't um, go into effect um, or they're delayed considerably. So um, I have a feeling that um, given that we have a Trump presidency and we have majorities of Republicans in the House and Senate, um, that they're going to look at some of the, the regulations. And I don't think this, are, this is true just in the education space. I think it's true in the labor space, in the EPA space. Um, and uh, say, what do we want to roll back um, and focus on that? The problem, of course, is that they don't have that much time to do it because under this procedure, they only have, I think, two months, 60 days or so uh, to actually rescind them very quickly. Um, so to, to use this fast track procedure is, is a limited option for them. Uh, but I, I do think that at least initially next year, um, the focus won't be on new legislation so much as uh, what, was, what, was, what was regulated on by the administration recently. Carissa, what are states looking for from Congress? Is it leave us alone, please, or more than that? What was the question? Did, did you ask me to say, tell Congress to leave us alone? No. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. Um, I, I, so what I, I want to just echo something Sasha said. Um, we'd love to see uh, Perkins reauthorized. I mean, mm -hmm. it started Career up. Uh, it started up this right. year, and mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, didn't uh, it made it out of the House, but didn't make it any farther than that. Um, we've had a long time had a. Um, project on career readiness, and many of our states are working on that right now. We think it's a, it's a really important avenue that we need to expand on. I think it helps uh, in implementing ESSA as well, yes. because it provides some other, op other opportunities and other ways to do that. Um, I, I think Sasha's right about um, what we're hearing on uh, regulations and moving forward. I, I, I will say that like I, I think feeling like the game changes all the time uh, can be disruptive, but I, I what our states are doing is moving forward, and they've got plans. They've got an overarching vision for what they want for their state and the education for their for their students, and they're going to continue to move forward on that. Um, you know, Liz was right. There's there's things that are parameters around that, um, but they're going to continue to move forward on that, and it isn't it isn't necessarily going to matter. So, uh, as you can see, it's question and answer time. But <laughs> does anybody other than me have any questions? <laughs> OK, there we go. Thank you. Hi, Sharon Lynch. I'm a professor at George Washington University. You know, one thing um, we keep on hearing about, um, this political group wants this, and that one wants that, and you know, there's all this contentiousness. What's the role of research um, in um, some of the decision making, um, you know, both at the state level or at the federal level? Can you talk at all about what you might predict there? Well, I, I can give you one example of uh, something that I think will be really critical. Um, when we think about school improvement writ large, um, you know, we've done mm -hmm. accountability systems 15 ways from Sunday, right? But it's this, how do we take care of schools once we've identified them in any way, um, going from four models uh, to now being a, a fairly open system, it's going to be really important to know what works um, and make sure that we have honed in on that. We have the What Works Clearinghouse, but it's also important that we try some things we haven't done before, but we need the research to back that up and the evidence base uh, to make sure that the things that we're doing in schools are really making the impact that we expect that they're going to have. So that would be one example. 
One thing I think I would add there um, is an area where we've seen some real progress around school discipline reform. And what, you know, what we're hearing a lot is that school leaders and educators, classroom educators, are really looking for advice and alternatives and ways to address things like implicit bias, alternatives to exclusionary discipline. And I think the research there has been incredibly helpful. Um, and we're going to need more knowing what works. Um, what sustainable, uh, what implementation with fidelity looks like. And so I think there are a lot of areas like that. There's been some really great progress um, on supports for students with disabilities, for example, with a new focus in ESSA around um, the English proficiency for English learners. We're going to need more research about how to best meet the needs of English learners um, in all sorts of settings. So I think there's a lot of really valuable research that will help us to make sure that all schools are serving all students well. I just I want to add one other thing because I think there's a there's a new responsibility um, because high quality research follows a scientific method and in the absence of someone in the White House who doesn't believe in you know who believes in science um, I think there is a there is a new responsibility to make sure that we understand what high quality research looks like and um, because there are still places where we need that research to best meet the needs of kids there are places where high quality research exists we just have to make sure we understand it and we implement it with the fidelity we can. Um, and, and there are places where we are going to need to under, like we are gonna need lots of people to understand um, how to read high quality research and, and then how to use it. I would just quickly say there is the strengthening research, education research uh, bill uh, that like many bills in Congress has stalled. Yeah. Um, and I believe it was designed to sort of better weld together um, research on improvement and what's ha and helping schools actually use it in practical context. It has gotten tied up, I think, in part maybe because of concerns over a different federal law, the one that deals with student data privacy. And obviously, you can see how questions about research and student privacy might mix together and cause concern. So maybe, if not in 2017, in 20, maybe 2018, to Sasha's point, uh, one or both of those might be uh, areas of the law that, that members of Congress look at. We have a question from an Ohio listener uh, on the live stream. Uh, we're at 500 people on the live stream, so thank you people on the live stream. Uh, they're wondering whether uh, DeVos's previous work indicates that we should be concerned about the fragment, the quote, fragmentation of education and ultimately overlooking some students, end quote. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So some things I would say that I, you know, what we what we do know about the nominee is not a lot. Um, we have very very serious concerns about her um, attitude towards the safety and value and um, dignity and respect of LGBTQ students, yeah. um, and that's something we're deeply concerned about. But the fact that there's just not much out there that we know about um, how how she. Um, is committed to ensuring that students with disabilities are fully included and receive the accommodations and supports they're entitled to under law, that English learners are valued um, and receive the supports and accommodations they're entitled to, addressing race, um, disproportionality, disparate impact across areas, ensuring, for example, equitable access to rigorous courses and things like that. Um, I think there's a lot, what we do know is concerning, what we don't know is concerning, mm -hmm. um, and that is where we are right now. And, um, and the safety of immigrant and refugee students and access to a full and free public education, um, safe regardless of their documentation status. Yeah, I, I would oh, say yes, if, if we, what we know about school choice is that it's not an option that a lot of parents can take advantage of for a variety of reasons. Um, oftentimes with like a voucher scheme, for example, you can't find a way of getting your child to that private school. Or if your child has a disability, perhaps the private school doesn't want to accept your child. Or a history of uh, disciplinary infractions, perhaps they don't want to accept your child for that reason. Or you're not the same faith if it's a religious school. Um, so it, there's lots of reasons for why, um, you know, in a better Betsy DeVos, Secretary of Education role, um, we may see some students overlooked, those students perhaps without the means, the students who are maybe less desirable to the private school sector, if she decides that that is what she wants to promote as a Secretary of Education. If she decides she wants to promote private schools, um, that, is a limit, lim that is a limitation that's going to be placed um, on the kinds of policies um, and in terms of equity uh, that, she, that she can really talk about. Um, but I, I will say that she's going to be limited frankly, by her own party in some cases, because she won't have 
this carrot that other secretaries have had necessarily of a large new funding stream that she can dedicate towards um, promoting school choice. And she'll also be limited by the fact that her own party made very clear they didn't want the sec secretary really dictating or incentivizing policy to states when it came to the Every Student Succeeds Act that's now being implemented. So she doesn't have as many tools in, in, her, in her toolkit that, that other secretaries have had to kind of make good on her school choice promise, uh, or at least the promise that the president-elect has made mm -hmm. of a $20 billion funding stream that he wants to uh, try to push for, and as his lead advocate, presumably, that she will want to push for as well. Andrew, I just want to, yeah. I, I just want to say that I think, um, I, I think it's premature for me to like, answer the original question, but um, to, to think about opportunities for kids, it comes in a wide variety of ways. Um, it can come in broadband access, like in places like South Dakota and Utah that get access to kids in rural places. It can come in you know, uh, open enrollment for students. I mean, there, we've been talking about the, the lightning rod places, but there, there are a lot of ways to provide opportunities for kids. Um, and I think um, we, we need to keep that on the table as well. Sure, so. last, last question, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Ashley Moore. I'm a school counseling grad student here at the NG Shed. Um, my question is, with some of the concerns over school climate and the potential emphasis on career readiness, do you see the role of school counselors potentially changing or having more of an emphasis in some of the schools? Um, I guess, you know, coming down from the district level, that sort of thing? Yeah, I think school counselors are more important than ever before for both the reasons um, that you stated, the fact that we do have this emphasis on career counseling, and as well as the fact that um, the new ESSA law does emphasize the importance of of kind of school quality as an indicator that encompasses non-academic factors, um, which can include things like um, you know uh, the school climate that uh, exists within a, a school environment. So, um, school counselors play a critical role in improving school climate, in addressing the mental health needs of students. Mm -hmm. I mean, if anything, in light of the new law, we need more counselors on the ground, both who can advise students in the more career and uh, career and college-oriented capacity, as well as who can address those those uh, the needs that they have um, to just achieve generally. I would just co-sign what Sasha said in not only the um, not only the role of school counselors, but the presence, to your point. Right. And, and that is that we still have abysmal student to counselor ratios in most of our states. They're among the first cuts <laughs> when there are cuts in many cases. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And um, if it's not the li already the library media specialist. Um, so I, there, absolutely, we I, and that is that is a role again that that in the local and state space we can you know we can make use of people who are already passionately invested in making sure that we have the schools our children deserve and this this becomes one of our opportunities in fighting for more school counselors and sort of you know thinking about the data point that came out of the the Obama administration about the availability of counselors when compared with the presence of police. Um, I think it's really important to think about that and both making sure that we continue to have access to data like that and that we learn from it. Yes. Um, and I think you know, one of the things we're worried about is what does a law and order rhetoric look like um, in, a, in a classroom full of third graders? And do those third graders get the support that they need or are they criminalized? And I think that, that's the other thing to think about in this context. Um, definitely expanding access to school counselors and just thinking about um, the role that, that school police um, mm -hmm. might play in schools and the way in which uh, that has a negative impact on the, the um, experiences of children. All right, well, we're going to have to leave it there. Please put your hands together for our wonderful time. Thank, Thank you very much. I hope that's given you something to chew on. Uh, well, and that was a pun, because now it's time for a break, and we've got plenty to chew on, which is upstairs on the second floor. Uh, and we will see you all back here at 3.20. The good news is we're trending on Twitter, so thank you very much for all of your support uh, on Twitter as well. We'll see you back here at 3.20. OK, timing is what it is, so we're going to begin right away. Uh, thanks very much. Um, Real quick, just to, just a quick mention again. Our t hashtag is EdElect2016. Please keep using it. We appreciate your help. I'm going to bring to the stage now Mark Bumster. He's our government and politics editor for Education Week, and he oversees all of the reporters you've been watching today. So he'll, he's going to bring together the various parts of our story and get you to the next level.
Hi, welcome back. Welcome back. As uh, people filter in, please uh, please find a seat. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, the rest of the program. Several other people coming on. It's going to be pretty a pretty interesting afternoon. It has been interesting so far. Um, as Matthew said, I'm Mark Bomster. I'm the um, Education Week Government and Politics Editor, and I just want to say it's been been uh, quite a wild ride for everybody this year. It's been in the uh, in the in the uh, federal politics beat. Um, as you saw from our reporters who were up here, they have been all over the country staying on top of what the implications of, of uh, these changes have meant for public education. Um, it's been a quiet ride, qu quite a quiet ride for everybody, and I don't just mean the election. Um, I want to ask people to do a little bit of just a, a, a think back. Just think back about a year ago. It was just about a year ago when we uh, it, were in the middle of an election campaign, all the debates were taking place, there was plenty of speculation about what was going to happen with the presidency, what was going to happen with Congress. At that time, Congress was in the middle of just a couple of weeks away from doing something that many folks thought they would never get around to doing, which was overhauling the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Uh, it's, uh, it's hard to remember, but uh, the, after all of that talk, after all of the concern about the outdated No Child Left Behind Act, there really was a bipartisan consensus, something that many folks found surprising at that time, uh, to come together and, and to revise the law, which became the Every Student Succeeds Act. And ESSA was hardly, it was a long time coming, but it was hardly the only thing that was happening in the education policy world or in the nation at that time. Um, we can all take a look in, in the course of just the last eight years over the tenure of the Obama administration. There was a tremendous amount of changes that have, that have taken place that affected public education in general. Uh, the uh, administration came back at a time, uh, came into office at a time when school districts and states were still clawing their way back from the Great Recession with huge impacts on local capacity, on their ability to continue funding their programs. Uh, the economic stimulus program raced to the top. All of the federal money that was at hand for the federal government at that time allowed for a, a pushing and a swaying of education policy in some pretty unexpected ways. Um, states jumped on board with the Common Core state standards, and all we all know what that, what kind of uproar, disruption that caused, adopted by many states at the same time. Much political pushback. Uh, much of the, uh, much of that continues at this time. And at the same time, we've, we've seen, as several of our speakers alluded to, huge demographic changes that have continued to take place uh, in the school systems, in the student population itself. The shift to a majority minority school enrollment around the country, uh, the continued role and influx of English language learners and their unique needs in the school systems. Uh, all of this was happening at a time when, uh, when uh, states were attempting to really flex their muscles and define themselves and their role with regard to education policy and the federal government. So here we are, we are stepping back into this environment with a brand new federal education law on the landscape. Um, the states, the feds, the uh, school districts are all trying to figure out what that means in practice, how they're going to relate to each other. And they're doing it with a new White House team, of we've, as we've heard, which really has, not, has yet to show all of its cards on education policy. So what's next? Um, I, I wanted to just recap briefly some of, um, some of what we heard in the course of the first speakers. I think uh, uh, there was so much coming at us all at once. I was trying to take some notes along the way just to get a good sense of the, of the takeaways from folks. There were some common themes, and, and uh, the people who were here before really, really sounded some, some unique things. I think from, from Laura Brown, I was particularly struck by her comments on the, the possibility, maybe the hope, of some bipartisan compromise or action uh, that may take place between the major parties if they are able to recognize that the, the pushback of uh, public cynicism that, that was expressed by many of the voters in the most recent election cycle is something that, is a, that contributes to this, this cycle of, of uh, elect and throw the bums out. Uh, that, that, that may be an opening if, if uh, politicians and policymakers are able to seize it going forward. Uh, she mentioned also that there may well be money for infrastructure that could be shaken out of, uh, out of Trump's proposals, and there could be some bipartisan room for that. Now, this is something that could, uh, could 
result in, in money being getting shaken down for in infrastructure at the school levels and at the state levels should that come to pass. Um, and um, in her view, Trump may actually care about education. We don't know an awful lot of what he's said aside from school choice, aside from some comments having to do with child care. And yet, uh, this is something that, that rhetorically was on the agenda. It's something that could be, that could be seized upon. We're yet to, we've yet to know what, whether that's going to happen or not. Uh, the Ed Week reporters who were following the campaigns very carefully, uh, they, every, they along with everyone else know that, the, that both Trump and his education secretary designate, they're essentially, um, they're essentially tabula rasa on, on education policy with, with a couple of exceptions. Although at the same time, uh, there's some, some significant concern on the parts of the civil rights community about enforcement, about whether the guidance is going to be maintained from the states and from others going forward, uh, whether they're going to get what they need from the federal government in the role that it is continuing to, to need to play all the way along. We do know also that, that with the state's legislatures, with state superintendents and governors taking more control over education policy, um, that uh, the, we're going to be looking much more closely at a, at a political structure which is dominated by the Republicans at the state level. And yet that breaks down in many subtle ways. There's not really a, necessarily a monolith as to where that's going to be going. So that we are going to be looking very closely as state legislatures convene in the next month or two as governors begin to roll out their specific policies and, and budget proposals as they uh, lay out their education agendas in their state of the state speeches to see where this thing is going to go going to go forward next. Um, we also know that that uh, the education department is going to need to cope with regulations that were on the table from the outgoing administration and it's a good question whether some of that will be rolled back by the incoming administration uh, in the form of congressional review in the form of policy fiats. So, the, that is really the context in which, in which all, of the, all of these predictions are taking place. Um, I'd like to shift gears just a little bit to take a look at the speakers that we have coming up next. Um, if the folks who were speaking to us this morning were essentially looking, to some degree, looking back to the, to the, to the election itself and trying to read some tea leaves, um, we're hoping to get some big picture perspective from the next series of speakers on the path forward um, and the political cultural shifts that, are, that we're all trying to absorb at this point. Um, we're going to be hearing in the next few minutes from um, Atlantic's national correspondent, James Fallows, who's been on the road and in the air <laughs> all over the country, listening to folks about uh, uh, from the ground about their insights as to uh, what they feel about about public education, what they feel about the changes that are taking place in society itself, and how that fits into the, the role of policymakers going forward. We're also going to be hearing from Cecilia Munoz, who is director of the Domestic Policy Council in the Obama administration. She's really in an ideal position to share with us some of the things that will still need to be done on public education uh, in the road toward, toward assuring that, that public schools are, are at the best quality for all sorts of students, what the unfinished business is of the administration that be leaving office, what are some of the challenges and the opportunities that are available for the next administration. And we're also going to be hearing from uh, a pair of folks who, will, who are actually at the state level, who will actually have their hands on the, on the levers of policy, people who it falls to to take this new federal education law and the priorities in their own individual states and to make them real in their own schools. Um, we'll be hearing from Minnesota Education Commissioner Brenda Casilius and also from a Maryland State uh, Board of Education member, Laura Wheeldryer. Uh, and they, they're the ones who are going to be involved in this get acquainted period with the new administration nationally. They're the ones who will have to navigate between all of the political and policy currents with their state legislatures, with their governors, and uh, they're going to have to do that uh, against the backdrop of, a, of uh, strict accountability systems, of the continuing rollout of, of ESSA, the continuing implications from, uh, from, their own, from their own standards. So with that, um, what I would like to do is I would like to turn things over now to Maria, Maria Vols Ferguson, who is the Executive Director of Center on Education Policy. And she'll moderate our first panel from, uh, from our state level policymakers. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to uh, try and keep the energy up because I know everyone's probably getting a little tired um, towards the end of the day. I want to point out that uh, I'm lucky enough to actually have two real educators who have log time in <laughs> classrooms and school districts, um, schools in their respective communities. So, um, so we're going to bring the discussion a little bit more uh, maybe down to earth and talk about some of the issues that they've been dealing with in their um, positions. Um, I wanted to start by taking a moment to look back a little bit on the last eight years. We've been talking about um, political administrations and their impact on education. So I thought maybe each one of you could reflect on your experiences about the last eight years and some of the national education policies and how it has affected you in the roles that you have now. Jim, want to start first? Or? I mean, I think the last eight years have brought some incredibly important gains for us nationally. Um, when I think about um, some of the most exciting things, I would say is that the high school graduation rate is significantly up nationally for the first time in 30 plus years. And most of that progress happened between 2008 and 2014. So when you look at um, the data from 2014, we have our biggest high school graduating class. It's the most diverse and reflects the most low income students. And at the same time, college readiness rates have stayed flat. Um, but spread across many more students. College enrollment rates are up, especially for going right after high school, which as we know from the data is really important to getting kids through college. So I, you know, I take those as major wins that came from an administration that used a lot of incentive to get, incentives to get states to move aggressively. Um, they pushed innovation, evidence-based reforms, and that that has had a positive effect. Um, from my own work in Baltimore and on the Maryland State Board, I would say uh, charter schools and the proliferation of charter schools have been a real game changer. So while the um, evidence nationally about their impact is mixed, I think in our inner city cores, um, they have drastically or dramatically perhaps is the right word, changed the trajectory for low income and uh, black and brown students and that's been a big thing that's happened over the last eight years. Um, my day job is that I work with Bob Balfonce at Johns Hopkins University, and he coined the term dropout factories for our lowest performing high schools with graduation rates of less than 67%. Mm -hmm. And in the last eight years under this administration, we've cut the number of dropout factories in this nation in half. So there were 1,500 when he first did the analysis. There are only about 750 left now. Um, so I think a lot of really important things have happened in the last eight years. In terms of my work on the state board, I think the bad news about that is we've picked the low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. You know, like we've fixed the things that were going to be an easier lift, and what's left in front of us are some significant and intractable issues that we have to face going forward. Well, I would say for Minnesota, it's been very positive. Um, uh, we've been able to really look at the law and with under the waivers and develop a school support system that is valued by educators, that feels supportive to them, mm -hmm. and put accountability in its right spot. Mm -hmm. um, to help drive those levers that really make a difference for kids. We've also seen higher graduation mm -hmm. rates, especially for students of color and our students with disabilities, which has been a huge focus. We've been able to fix some of our funding systems in a more consolidated and flexible way of use of funding uh, with school improvement processes. Uh, so that's been a very uh, positive <coughs> outreach. I think one thing that gets uh, overlooked a lot uh, because of the focus on evaluation and test scores, which I think was a little bit of an overstep, yep. but I think that the focus on teacher quality and support systems for teachers and the push around the teachers as the professional in the classroom was a positive one that came out of this administration. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that that is also a very uh, big push uh, and, and positive for our state. And then I can't um, get rid of the segment without talking about early childhood. So I think that um, early childhood and the race to the top uh, initiatives around uh, early childhood was a huge game changer for us in Minnesota. 
and also the kind of uh, standards around Head Start and imp improving the quality of Head Start programming in our state. So there are a number of really good things, I think, that came out of this administration that we should continue and move forward with. Um, and then, of course, this administration and the, and the president working with the Congress put in place the Every Student Succeeds Act. So that got done, uh, and that is an important step forward for all of us uh, in, the, in the United States. So. I wanted to ask a question specifically about early childhood because you mentioned it on an earlier panel. Uh, Allison Klein from Edweek thought that maybe that was one area Absolutely. where we might see some consensus amongst lawmakers mm -hmm. in terms of the federal role. Um, can you talk a little bit more just about um, maybe your individual experiences with early childhood education and if you indeed agree with that mm -hmm. um, moving forward that this might be a place where we can see some consensus? Well, I, I'm actually a Head Start baby myself. So um, I have a personal investment in knowing that preschool makes a difference for children um, and early literacy skills and language development and, and the support to the families that Head Start gives. Um, so early childhood education is absolutely, absolutely a critical first step. And I do think, I also heard um, when I was listening to the debates in the town hall when uh, President-elect Trump was speaking and I was just taken aback like, wow, the second thing that came out of his mouth was education because we hadn't heard anything about education. Mm -hmm. So I felt like if that off-the-cuff remark is where his heart is coming from, maybe there's a glimmer of hope in there that education will take a priority um, for this president-elect after he gets a chance to settle down and start thinking about his policy. So I try to assume good at first, and we'll hope to um, see where he goes with early childhood. But um, it didn't get broad by um, bipartisan support with ESSA. I mean, it's mm -hmm. mentioned. I know that Senator Murray really pushed for it uh, to be included, but it's uh, watered down. And I, it'd be nice if we could get Head Start reauthorization going. It's overdue. And um, also get a, a bigger focus on some of those um, child development grants to states. Laura, before you answer, can I just put a little filter on it? Because, yeah. because you focus um, you know, at, at the secondary level, I mean, it, in some ways, your perspective on early childhood is very interesting because you're sort of seeing what happens down the line. So can, you, um, can your answer sort of share a little bit from that perspective as well? Um, I'll do my best. Uh, so I think when I think about early childhood, in, um, specifically in Maryland, we've done a lot to uh, advocate the expansion of um, pre-K and universal kindergarten. Uh, and I think the role the state has played that's been so important has been about ensuring quality yes. and you know really um, holding the programs to a higher standard. Um, and I'm, we're really proud of the work that we've done with that. What we see nationally from the work that we do at Hopkins is that even in you know our uh, most challenged school systems, you often see elementary schools where. Um, minority and low-income students keep pace with their peers through fifth grade. And this is some important research that we've done. It's like, and you, everybody's heard the 90-90-90 schools, and, and that's become, I think, part of the lexicon of what is possible at elementary school. But when we look at the middle schools that we work with, and you look at kids who've come from elementary schools proficient or advanced in reading and math, and you think, like, no problem. We got this in middle school. Like those. Um, in other words, those reforms are going to trickle up as the kids move up in the grades. What happens at middle school? Why don't those advantages hold? And I think what we're coming to understand is the role of poverty, that um, the uh, long-term effects of concentrated poverty cannot be overcome without specific targeted action. So um, Dr. Balfonce has done some research about just the, the role of children's lives in um, communities of uh, concentrated and generational poverty. And um, I know this is not our topic, so I won't go far <laughs> into this, but um, it's, not, it's not enough just to get kids through elementary school feeling good. You um, Actually, when they get to middle school, every kid needs close personal scrutiny mm -hmm. to make sure they're holding on to those gains and not slipping back. So I need clarity. I don't know what the 90-90-90 schools uh -huh. are. So, and I'm going to presume that maybe some people here don't. Am I the only one who doesn't know this? I see okay. a hand in the audience. <laughs> OK. So can you very so briefly, what are they? They've been, I think there have been a number of reports written about these schools that are 90% free and reduced price lunch eligible students, 90% minority mm -hmm. students. Um, and 90% proficiency or above rates. Okay. Okay. Um, so sort of debunking 
this notion that um, your zip code or your income level determines your ability to perform on state assessments or to attend a high-performing school. Uh, but it, that I think for a long time we've banked on, hey, get the kids um, to a certain level in preschool or get them through elementary school reading on grade level and it does not mean you can take your foot off the gas when they right, transition right. to middle school even if it's a K to 8 lots of districts have moved to K to 8s to diminish whatever gains be, uh, were lost in the transition between right. elementary and middle school and it's not enough can okay I, can I say one quick thing yeah, about that I think got a lot of topics I, here I think the one thing to know is that those are cumulative effects that happen with children as they go over, so you have to overcome their, their adverse childhood experiences that they have. But I think also one thing that's overlooked often is that tests are harder as grade levels get up. For sure. And cut scores are harder. Mm -hmm. to, to be considered proficient, it's tougher uh, as the grades go, go. So it's not like kids you know, are um, always not to the, at the level that they should be. It's right. because simply the standards are harder and right. the tests are harder and the, the cut scores are higher. Okay. Um, I want to move specifically to ESSA now to look ahead um, just because we're crunched on time and I want to leave plenty of time for questions and answers. So like everyone else said, if you have questions, start thinking about them now and when it's time, we'll line up at the microphone and ask. Um, We've talked a lot about the new flexibilities for state leaders and that states are in charge under ESSA. Are you excited about these flexibilities and um, are you also challenged by them in terms of capacity issues, in terms of, of where you are? Well, I think that this has been somewhat a misunderstanding of the new ESSA law that people think, oh, states can do whatever they want. I mean, you still have testing, grades three through eight, math and reading, you have to have equal weighting for that. You still uh, need to consider growth or some other academic measure. We really only have one other new indicator of accountability around this kind of well-rounded quality uh, indicator, which is where Minnesota is really interested in what does that mean for kids and delivering more opportunity to access for children around equity um, so that we can raise student achievement. So I'm not sure where the conversation is about all this extra flexibility. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see that there's a lot of extra flexibility, but we do have um, some opportunity how we define that and how we work through that. But I think it's more of a, a kind of curve in the bend in the road than it is a complete U-turn right. uh, off of accountability. And I think that's how other chiefs feel as well, that um, we're, we're continuing forward with our plans and continuing forward with the work and um, just doing what we think we need to do for kids. Now, in terms of a lot of the research that I know my organization has done, state capacity is usually an issue yeah. that comes up. I mean, have you been dealing with that in terms of, of your agenda, both you know in days past and then looking forward as well? And how have you managed it? Yeah. I think this is, I mean, I am very excited about the implications of ESSA and the chance to reflect on what we've learned mm -hmm. and apply, you know, it's a moment to pause and think about hey, all those times we complained about what was going on in the last few years, how do we want to do things differently now? And you know, with a robust round of stakeholder engagement, there's a chance to re-engage some partners who maybe have disengaged over the last few years. Um, so I am enthusiastic about it. Um, I think the capacity issue is real. My vision for the way this would work the best is it's really going to demand new relationships between SEAs and LEAs. So, Traditionally, in my experience, so Brenda, jump in and tell me if your experience is different, but in my experience, you know, state departments of education were set up as monitors, as compliance officers, as funders, um, and what is demanded now is more of like strategic thought partners working, you know, shoulder to shoulder, slow, uh, sleeves rolled up with districts to figure some of this out. I think the capacity issue cuts across states and districts and is going to just demand some new ways of working together, which is always challenging to the status quo. And, and that's exactly what I inherited at, in the Minnesota State Department. You know, teachers would tell us they just hide underneath when the State Department <laughs> would come out of their desks. But we have, um, when Arnie Duncan came out and said, you have waiver and you have this flexibility, we took him at his word and we really developed a whole new system of uh, strategic support to schools so that our focus was about supporting technical assistance and being a good coach and doing it regionally um, through through the state and through our state cooperatives that we had and to take what we had that was good and make it even better 
um, to support teachers alongside them rather than a top-down approach. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really worked for us. And so we're going to continue that uh, through us. In terms of capacity, what we've done is just go to our state legislature and say, and we've had advocates there who have been part of our regional centers of excellence, this new support system that we've had under our waiver. And they've um, been supportive of providing additional dollars to that support. So we'll go, continue to go back and ask our state legislature. And with ESSA, we now have the 7% for school improvement. Mm -hmm. That you know, does provide some opportunity to be able to focus on school principal leadership and school improvement in different ways that maybe were a little top heavy with the previous uh, administration. Can I just add one thing? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think an example of dealing with this issue of capacity is I just want to give a shout out to John White in Louisiana and the work that he's doing. You know, he um, convened a webinar of people all over the country a few weeks ago, and he basically said, we know there were things about SIG that didn't work. So he's writing his ESSA plan, right? He's like, we, let's learn from all the money we poured into SIG that did not translate into better outcomes for kids. And one thing we know is you can't impose right. school reform on a district. It doesn't work. It doesn't take. It doesn't last. It doesn't get you the results in two or three years. You know, it doesn't, it's not, it's not that simple and it's not that easy. So what he said is, I want to know if you are an organization. So he said, I asked my staff, who's doing what in school improvement and, and with what effect? And they had to come back to him and report, like, sadly, there's not like a school improvement directory out there that tells you everything everybody's doing and what outcomes they've gotten. So he asked any organization that thinks they have something to add for kids in Louisiana to send in their information and what he's going to do is convene everybody like in a big um, convention center room in mid-January and he's going to have these partners, whatever their um, offerings may be, sitting side by side with school districts talking about co-developing a plan for school improvement. So again, not you know, force-fitting mm -hmm. things and I think that's the kind of forward thinking this is going to demand to get to the next level. Interesting. Um, when I reflect on the last couple of years in education, I think about the, the big words and the big issues that have been at the fore. Technology, charters, assessment, um, career and technical education. Moving forward, do you see these on your horizon? Are you prioritizing um, one more than another? Do you have, you know, do you have any priority areas? What, what, are, what are the big issues for you moving forward? So there's been a lot of com conversation about Common Core. That's really just about standards. What should kids know and be able to do? Uh, you have to have a guide post for, uh, for teachers in the classroom and what they're going to know and be able to do. And for Minnesota, we've, we've kept our standards the same. So that will be, I think the, the issue was the assessments to those standards. And then the assessments then being part of a teacher evaluation. And that's really what kind of unraveled the common core um, uh, intent of having high standards for children to meet. Brenda, so, good news, you're getting lots of head nods in the audience <laughs> while you're saying that. So yeah. Yes, and I think had, had they not tried to have the assessment do everything, right. and that if the assessment could have been just, you know, how do you measure a student's annual progress, I don't think we would have had the kind of pushback that we had, because I think that's what was originally intended in a very bipartisan way. I mean, this was brought by business leaders and governors who brought, um, who, who said, let's get together and, and develop these standards. So. Now they did them, and now they want to jettison them out. Well, that would just be a whole big upset to the to the system. I think another um, piece of advice that I might um, just kind of intervene to the new administration is, you don't want to just jettison out um, the regulations either. I mean, we've been working hard for a year. Plus, it will be a complete distraction to anything that they want to bring forward because it takes a long time to do rulemaking. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and. And that would be a distraction. Rather, why don't they just regulate when we turn in our plans? That's what the former administration did. I can't tell you how many back and forth calls I had to <laughs> Arnie and all of the, the US Ed folks saying, no, but we want to do it this way. Mm -hmm. uh, so that negotiated process is the way for them to kind of you know, uh, influence uh, their policy agenda rather than spend their time rewriting all new rules and right. being distracted. All right. That's a good point. I, I mean, just to pick up on a point that Brenda made, if they jettison the regs, it's pushing the responsibility back to the states to develop regs, and that we're getting farther and farther away Take from the ability to compare across states, to have a body of knowledge about all of our students around the country. And I think there is a role for the yes. federal government to play in terms of ensuring accountability and equity. 
I said many nice things about the last eight years, but the truth, and they're all true, but the truth is if you scratch beneath the surface, the progress in states was uneven. And that means capacity and a plan and focus in a state, in a district matters. It's not just gonna happen without that. And so to me, that is the role of the feds to come in and where there's not that capacity, make sure somebody is thinking in those ways. So to push the point I was trying to make is to push those regs back right. to the state introduces 50 different political contexts and a huge time factor and element. I think they're very necessary. States actually, I think, want guardrails um, for how to move forward. But okay. I, I do think that no matter what you try to do under accountability, you're always going to have 50 different um, it's a federalized system. Yeah, you always have 50 <laughs> different go. state, state uh, plans because it's just, that's just how we are localized right. in, our, in our delivery of education. Okay, I'm going to pause because I know it's time for questions, so I encourage anyone to step up. Um, hey, Rebecca. <laughs> Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Rebecca Thesson. I'm an assistant professor of educational administration and also a former central office employee. I just wanted to ask a little bit about the idea of how you've been building capacity in Minnesota and just what you spoke about in terms of the work the state's doing. When we look at NCLB, one of the major critiques of that legislation was the lack of um, direction, guidance, funding given to build capacity to facilitate school improvement and specifically instructional improvement mm -hmm. at the school level and at the district level. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, your state's doing some good work, but then uh, in a lot of cases, the district superintendent is turning over pretty rapidly, mm -hmm. two years or less in most urban areas. You know, what guidance? State chiefs too. Yeah. <laughs> what guidance do you have for other states yeah. and, and also for districts when you think about doing this work of building capacity mm -hmm. over time yeah. under ESSA yeah. when more responsibility is placed on them and in light of the frequent turnover in, in leadership? So the keys there are to make things leader-proof. Um, and the, <laughs> the best way to make things leader-proof is to get your legislature behind and have really broad stakeholder engagement and to involve your teachers. Um, if your teachers are involved in de developing those policies, then typically, because there's a lot of teachers, right? In, your, in, in our state, we have over 60,000 teachers. You know, and if they're supporting something, then they're going to be talking about it in their communities and with leaders and with their legislators of the, state, of the state houses. And so I think that that's critical. And so what we did in Minnesota was, with the waiver, we developed a statewide system of support by building on what was already there and not really working. So our cooperatives, which were these 11 regional centers throughout our state, were a large geographical state, they were just developing plans. And what we wanted to do was work on implementation yeah. of the plans, not just putting something on a shelf, but actually <laughs> doing things for kids and helping teachers be better teachers for kids that look very different than the kids that they had been typically uh, teaching because of our diverse demographic shift quite rapidly. And then we, in 2013, passed a law called the World's Best Workforce Legislation, which then codified strategic planning at the district level, required stakeholder engagement of communities that are in, in the schools as well as teacher engagement. And then they develop those plans, they own those plans, they own their school improvement plans, and we work as coach and help them through implementation science to be able to look at the data and do a continuous improvement model. And we're just really guides on the side and getting them the resources that they need to be successful. I think one other thing that we've done in Minnesota really well is advocate against silver bullets. Um, and national policy and ideas, things that we knew would become a big distraction parent, parent trigger, A to F grading, retaining third graders, um, you know, you name, you name the, uh, the policy. We were, we were trying to guard against any of that stuff that seemed like it was going to be a fix, but really we just invested in teachers. We should end the panel now because there's not going to be a better answer than that. And it's all on our website on how we did it. All the tools are on our website. We encourage everybody to go. Um, we won an award from the Harvard um, uh, Ash Center for Government Innovation. So we're pretty proud of this work around supporting our schools and their teachers. Well, there's no dropping the mic here, so we're going to have another question. <laughs> Good. All right. <laughs> Talk about pressure now. Um, uh, my name is Tommy, Tommy Sheridan. I'm um, with the National Head Start Association. Yay. And as a native Minnesotan as well, I'm probably your biggest fan here, yeah. uh, Commissioner Casale. <laughs> so thank you. I guess my question is is something that I've been hearing from a lot of Head Start grantees across the country and conversations they've, they've had with uh, a lot of their LEA partners. And really, it's the 
So what should we be doing? Yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot, and we heard this throughout the panels yeah. earlier, is that there's so much uncertainty. What advice would you give them? There's a lot of excitement, I think, from, from ESSA yeah. about coordination, collaboration, mm -hmm. but now with a lot of questions, what, what would you say? Brenda, you're going to have to take this okay. one. We've been investing in Head Start. So we invested in the last um, funding session $10 million in Head Start. And we've also been looking at mixed delivery systems with our child care uh, programming. And so we've been trying to intentionally uh, partner. We have also a scholarship program that targets for our poorest kids, uh, gives uh, $7,500 to families to be able to choose their own child care, whether it's private or school-based. We also have a set aside. We have Pathway 1s where parent, they're a full parent choice. And then Pathway 2s that go to school so that they can plan and, uh, and, and be able to do, do facility changes and that kind of thing and know that they're going to have that number of kids showing up. And then the governor won $25 million for universal pre-K for four-year-olds last session. And so we are really trying to do this kind of multi-pronged approach so that everybody stays happy in the early childhood space. Um, and I would suggest to Head Start that you continue to partner with your local school district in any way that you can to coordinate services, especially transportation, which becomes quite a barrier to some of our families, especially in really rural isolated areas. Um, so those are, those are my suggestions. Um, partner in mixed delivery, um, raise standards, um, advocate at the state capitol for more funding for Head Start, um, and you know, work with human services to, to um, use multi-layered funding so that you can go to all-day programs rather than just half-day programs. That helps families, too. So I mean, early childhood is just a win, right? You know, it helps the kid, it helps the parent, it helps the family, helps the economy. It's just, it's just such a win all around for everybody. So do it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Those are our marching orders, everybody. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, hi, I'm Matt from the Center on Education Policy. And I just have a quick question about President-elect uh, Trump's mixed messages on education. Um, how, at the state level, do you deal with those mixed messages at this point, um, looking <laughs> forward? Question. Um, I think probably with most of the country, we're taking a breath right now and not moving rapidly in any one direction. And that's the honest answer. I mean, there's a lot of mixed messages, right? Um, there's also fewer carrots and sticks at uh, the secretary's disposal to make things happen. That's so. I think it's a wait and see period of, unfortunately, of a lot of uncertainty for everyone. And I, I wish I had a better answer. Hold on, maybe Brenda has a better answer. <laughs> so let's give her the mic. Brenda, no, I take would, us home. I would say, see what you get when you get teachers up here. Pretty soon we'll have, we'll lead you I in feel like I'm about to. We're going to have to get up and stretch pretty soon, you know. So everybody at home will, on your table now stand up and stretch. Um, so I, I would say that um, it's been really challenging because the largest rhetoric that we've been dealing with has been some of his um, anti-Muslim speech and some of the bullying that we've seen in our schools has been really challenging. And so we heard some of that in the earlier panel. So I wish if I could talk to Donald Trump right now, I'd say, please, address the nation and start talking in a more positive way about our children and about our communities. We're all yeah. Americans. Um, so that would be the number one thing. And then focus on the things we agree on, early childhood. I mean, his daughter came out with a big early childhood push. And um, you know, fo start with what we agree on. Because, and also, um, Senator, uh, not Senator, uh, Representative Ryan, uh, Paul Ryan, uh, the House Speaker, I think that he also has a poverty agenda. Go out and talk to him. What is it that we can do to try to do things to support families, like housing, jobs, transportation, um, urban development, you know, rural uh, issues. I, th I think there's a lot of common ground um, that could be had if they, if they pick the things that they can agree on rather than fight about the little things that they don't. That's worked for us in Minnesota. We're going to let Man, that be I the very, right. <laughs> yes, and we're going to let that be the very optimistic final note because I'm going to get in trouble here if uh, we talk anymore. But thank you. Thanks. This is great. We really appreciate it. And I'm delighted to introduce our next two guests. Uh, Michael Foyer is Dean of the George Washington University Graduate School of Education and Human Development. And James Fallows is the National Correspondent for The Atlantic. 
Um, we're thrilled to have both of you here. Um, Jim, I've been a fan of your writing for a long time, and we have something in common. You've written extensively about Middle America. And when I came to the, uh, to the US, I spent eight years in central rural Illinois. Uh -huh. So I always say I see the world through corn-colored glasses. Um, um, let's start with a million dollar question. You know, what can we expect in terms of education policy? Michael, you want to take that? <laughs> I get the first one and it's a million dollar question. <laughs> well, I think it's um, an opportunity for us to reflect on uh, some of the basic policy issues that are going to come before us and ask to what extent do we know enough now to actually uh, predict with any kind of uh, sensitivity uh, what, what is actually going to take place. And uh, prediction is certainly one of the perhaps casualties of the recent election cycle. So even without a lot of statistical um, you know, uh, armament on me here, I would say one has to be cautious about this. But that said, I'll tell you what I'm worried about. I'm worried about the, um, this resurgent preoccupation or almost fetish with privatization uh, at the expense of what is I consider to be one of the, the most important cultural, historical, political, educational, economic advantages of the United States, which has been an investment in public education going back almost two centuries. So I worry about this um, recurrent overemphasis on this. On the other hand, the data are quite interesting about that. In spite of all of this pressure toward privatization and its most extreme version, vouchers, it is still the case that, that fewer than 10% of American children are actually in private school. Only 5% of American kids are in charter schools. Uh, and there is a general sense that there may be in these experiments with various types of privatization, some things that we can learn that would be of use in the public system, so I can, I can sort of live with that. The other thing that I'm most worried about in terms of education policy now is whether this rhetoric of, um, I don't know what to call it, it's a, it's a rhetoric of negativity and it's a rhetoric of exclusion uh, that I hope uh, we as a community of educators and teachers and scholars of education uh, and political people and policy makers uh, have the courage uh, to, uh, to push back against. And rhetoric turns into behavior. On that, the history is pretty clear. And that's why I hope that we can uh, face this rhetoric, again, with a certain amount of appreciation that what may actually happen will not match the most vicious parts of the, uh, and you can name the, the group. I think every one of the groups was included in one part of this, uh, of this campaign or another uh, against whom the rhetoric was ugly and debasing and fundamentally, I think, un-American. So we'll have to just hope that we can push back uh, against some of that. Jim, How's that for an optimistic? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, talking about optimism, um, Jim, I, um, I want to quote something that you had written in a recent um, article in The Atlantic. I believe that Donald Trump is clownishly unprepared to be president and even less suited by temperament. Have you changed your mind at all? Anything to be hopeful about? This was an article in The Atlantic that came out every four years. I do a story about presidential debates and how to think about the collision of personalities of rhetorical styles and all the rest. I was long ago a presidential speechwriter for Jimmy Carter. So this was my way of saying in the setup to an article about the Trump-Clinton debates that you shouldn't be confused about who I'm supporting in this election. You know, I think that the Donald Trump, in my view then and now, is the most unsuited person for this job who has ever been prepared to take it. And uh, my opinion has only gone down <laughs> since then. Uh, of, of, but he is apparently going, going to take the office. And, and as a performer, as a performer, which was what I was judging in the debates, he was a remarkable performer. And I was trying to explain how I quoted Jane Goodall at length about what she'd learned from, from studies of the primates. About, and she said that, that she was exactly, I mean, I'm just, I'm just quoting now. She was saying that she was exactly reminded of chimpanzee dominance rituals when she saw Trump dealing with his little Marco and, you know, lying Ted and the others on the debate stage. So in terms of my feelings about the president, which are not really our subject here, I am 
um, I am apprehensive for the nation. In terms of other sources of American resili resilience, including education, I'm happy to join you in trying to look for the bright side. Um, one of the things about that article I found super interesting was someone had analyzed the, the, the words used, and uh, most of the candidates used words of the of fourth and, and fifth, uh, third and fourth graders. I thought, oh, that's a whole different spin on telling 10-year-olds you yes. can be president <laughs> when you grow up. <laughs> so, so has anybody else here been a speechwriter? You know, the, many people here are speechwriters. When, when I was working for, for President Carter, I actually got in trouble with some, uh, with the lying press, as we now call it, because I, I pointed out that some presidential speeches you direct at a seventh grade reading level. And that was seen as being somehow disrespectful. But in fact, public discourse, advertisements, news broadcasts, that's sort of what you're looking for. And that is, if you analyze, I think Jack Schaefer of Politico this year did it, other people have done that. If you analyze major politicians, usually it was the case, you know, both with Clinton and Bernie Sanders and all the other Republicans except Trump, it was sort of that sixth through eighth level discourse. And Trump was at the third grade discourse. And I quoted some of his, Things were saying, it's going to be great. We're going to have big deals. We only lose. We're going to win. It's going to be great. And so again, th this is he has won the electoral college. So this is this is the reality we are are now now dealing with. And I'll, I'll say one other thing. Your um, I got a a long note from a person whom I won't identify by gender or location, but whose job has been transcribing TV interviews over the last 10 years. This person attested that he or she had had more exposure to the content of Donald Trump's interviews and utterances than anybody else alive. And what was remarkable from that exposure, this person said, was there was no topic with the exception of eminent domain on which he had exhibited any substance knowledge of any sort beyond like the first sentence, it's going to be great. So when it comes to what is going to be the forecast for education policy or North Korea or whatever else, uh, we, we are all rolling the dice. Let's get back to hopeful. <laughs> um, you have traveled extensively in middle America, and you have great examples of what's working. Mm -hmm. Rural yeah. schools, which are uh, rural schools, um, mm -hmm. small school districts. Tell us about some of them. So, so the, the, um, to give you the 20-second the background version, for the past three plus years, ever since my wife and I moved back from China, we've been spending about half our time traveling in the parts of America we now think of as being not covered well by, by the media in sm medium-sized and smaller cities, looking at the ways they dealt with economic, uh, environmental, cultural, whatever, dislocation. And generally, the message we've been taking is that almost every place we went, people thought, oh, America's in terrible trouble. But here in Columbus, Mississippi, things are looking up. Here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, things are getting better. Here in Allentown, PA, here in Duluth, Minnesota. And so one of the areas where we'd ask people typically when coming into a town is, tell us about an interesting school. And if there was an answer to that question, or better yet, if there were five or six answers, that was a really good sign. And I, was, um, I can just reel off a, you know, a couple of, of, of places in the, in the Central Valley, California area, Fresno, and it's on Verones, Winters, California, too. There's all these wonderful schools of training the children of <coughs> migrant laborers to become sort of ag tech workers, you know, with all the sort of more, uh, much more water efficient and genomics based agriculture of, of that, that area. Uh, in inland Southern California, where I'm from, in San Bernardino, there are areas where they're trying to do that too. In uh, Dodge City, Kansas, again, which is now a majority Latino community, there are ways in which they're having, because of the Kansas state cutbacks, the citizens of Dodge City voted themselves a big school bond issue. So they, they have a, a quite ambitious school, which has, a, in addition to other things, a bass fishing team. They are competitive bass fishers, but they do other things beyond that. And they've had the last two teachers of the, of the year from Kansas have been from there. Um, Holland, Michigan has some very interesting things. Uh, they're just a, uh, I'll mention one other, um, St. Mary's, Georgia, the very southernmost coastal part of Georgia before you hit Florida. They have a very, very large headcount high school, the Camden County High School, which they keep very large because they're the perennial state football champion. But they also have a really impressive career technical education program there. Everybody goes out with a normal, quote unquote, um, education, but they are welders, and they are construction workers, and they are nurses, and they are criminal investigators, and all that. So most places we found several, at least a few, 
innovative public schools. I'll mention one more in Greenville, South Carolina, the A.J. Wittenberg Elementary School for Engineers. Huh. This is in downtown, <laughs> low income, minority, Greenville, South Carolina. And they train the kids as engineers with, with these engineers from GE and Michelin and BMW teaching there. So it's, it makes you feel stuff is actually ha happening in the okay. fabric of the country. You have um, lived abroad and reported extensively on China. And that's my segue mm. into my next question. So TIMS has just come out, the International Test for Math and Science. The PISA results are coming out. Um, there's a lot of kind of angst about where America ranks uh, because we don't do so well in the rankings typically. Um, is it all doom and gloom? Is this something we should be super worried about? Do you want to give the official answer? I can give the I'm, I'm, I'm answer. in no position to give an official answer, but I, I, I want to just say that um, I, I want to hear your answer to this. I, <laughs> I if you promise I, you're not going to change yeah. based on Jim's yeah. answer. Well, no, the point here is it's very important because it ties to what Jim was just saying about this experience in visiting some of these places across America. That there is a rhetoric of failure and comparative, um, comparative failure uh, that is very gripping on the political psyche generally. Now, some of the people here undoubtedly remember uh, in 1983, The Nation at Risk, which used some of the most uh, potent language uh, to make the case that we you know, were experiencing a rising tide of mediocrity. I that if a, foreign a foreign yes, if, a, if a foreign power were found to have been responsible for America's educational condition, it would be considered an act of war. I mean, it was this sort of, but compared to the rhetoric that Jim was describing in the most recent campaign, Nation at Risk seems sort of mild. <laughs> And so the point here is I would like to hear Jim's uh, view on how to square whatever the results are in things like Tim's and Pisa with the experience of people in communities that are really making a positive educational difference. Mm -hmm. So let's stipulate that the US has problems of all sorts, including in education. You know, the, the starting point is, is the second gilded age with all the extremes of wealth and poverty and corruption and people being dislocated by technology, et cetera, et cetera, and having highly unequal education, among other things. So everybody here knows that, and, and that is no news. Um, the main lesson I conveyed from living in China for almost four years is that the United States has terrible problems but anybody in China would trade them in one second for China's problems, you know, China, including in education. Um, and I'll give you a couple of illustrations. Um, if you think underprivileged American schools have a hard time, I'd say go to China. Uh, I spent a long time in far western China, sort of the equivalent as if the most depressed parts of Appalachia were as far away as Nevada or something. The, the geography of China is like the US if it stopped at the Rockies, or if it stopped at Nevada, if there were no California. You know, so the further in you go, the more deserty and more mountainy and poor it gets. We'd see these schools where the children would walk from their villages on Monday morning, you know, 10 or 12 miles. They would stay the whole week at the school, literally 14 or 15 teenagers per room about the size of a, sh a, size of a shipping container. And they'd have, you know, their little books and everything. I mean, it was it, hundreds of millions of people in China. Are, it's still a poor country with a lot of people doing that way where their faces were sort of permanently um, red from frostbite. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you can find, uh, I was in Shanghai as of mm -hmm. about 36 hours ago. And in Shanghai, where I think these TIMS measures are, are taken, you can find a layer of the very most sophisticated students. And if you compare the most privileged people in Shanghai with the run of the mill in Pennsylvania or Iowa, you can say, oh, we are falling behind. But that is um, a, uh, if it's useful in directing our attention, fine. You shouldn't be uh, dissuaded to think, oh, let's, let's have the Chinese uh, schooling system. I'll tell you one other anecdote. The, the reason I was in China, this is a secret, but it's just between us here. Uh, <laughs> no one will know. Um, back in my dim past, I'd, I'd been a Rhodes Scholar uh, and gone studying to Oxford. And so this, uh, through a long backstory, we've established a Rhodes Scholarship program for China. And so I was there 
for the second selection of a, of a winning class from, from, Chinese, um, from the Chinese universities. And these, as you can imagine, were a very impressive group of young people whom we were choosing from. There were four winners we chose from the entirety of China among, among 14 finalists. And even if you assume the raw talent distillation of four people out of a country of 1.4 billion, still the, the way in which they were looking forward to either going to Oxford or if they didn't win the scholarships, getting their graduate fellowships at Yale or at the University of Chicago or at Berkeley, the gap between what is available in the US in particular and the Western world in general and Chinese education is so enormous that yes, if making, if comparisons with China make us try harder, that's fine, but don't be fooled. No. I just want to segue uh, from that yeah. into a related yeah. point, and that is international comparisons in education have been around for a long time. And there's a great deal of good that can yeah. come from this kind of cross-national yeah. analysis and introspection and, and comparison. And there's also a certain amount of mischief that can, that can result from an over-reliance on certain kinds of scores and an over-reliance on league tables and all the rest. There was a time when the United States government, contemplating its involvement in international comparative studies, turned to an independent scientific organization for advice, which was a smart thing to do. Um, there was a time when the United States Congress, and this is when I met Jim Fallows, because I was at the Office of Technology Assessment, rest in peace, um, and that was an example of Congress turning to essentially a scientifically expert community for independent objective advice. So here you have a good example. Will there be an appetite on the part of this new government, and I ask that, I'm trying to be rhetorically neutral here and ask it rather more empirically. Yeah. Will there be an appetite for something that resembles credible, objective evidence in the service of improved policy making? The answer is, let us hope so. OK. <laughs> that's, that was, that, that was, that's, just, that's the short version of your answer, yes, let us hope. What do you think are some of the most urgent, um, if you had to give the new administration a wish list. What would you say are the top three education kind of policies we need to look at? Jim. <laughs> I'm going to answer a different version of that question. <laughs> that, that, uh, and again, I'll introduce it this way. In the current issue of The Atlantic, I have a, a, a long story about how to deal with China. Uh, what, what, whether, whether the assumptions of dealing with China for the last 40 years need to be re-examined because things are constricting so much there in, internally. And the premise of that piece, which went to press about two, hours, two, two weeks before the election, was that the United States would be carefully judging its options and, and the consequences of, of dealing with China. I'm not sure that that premise applies anymore. So too with education, the question I'll answer is, what do I hope the United States, not what I expect the, this administration will do, what I hope the, the United States w would do. Um, I'm not an education expert, I, I guess, so my answers therefore will, will be obvious. Um, the first is, is the obvious, the obvious point about everything in the United States at this moment, which is the simultaneous effects of polarization and denigration of the public. You know, the, the, in my view, the greatest moments of the United States have been when there was a coincident um, respect for the public and respect for the, the, the unifying, and ways to, to create opportunities for everybody. My, my, all of my forebears came from non-college families who went to college because of World War II and the GI Bill. And that's, that's how, you know, there was entirely different opportunities for, for them. That's my understanding of American history. If there is some way the United States could restore its sense of the public and the chance for, for everyone, I think that would be, um, uh, that, that would be my uh, first goal. A second goal I would have is I was, really impressed around the country by two phenomena that you all know about but I'd paid no attention to. And that was, number one, the career technical education 
um, wave, and also the, the roles of community colleges in, in, in that. I mean, I've known all about the commanding heights of education with our research universities, which are so important in the United States, but in place after place after place around the country, we found that the opportunity for, if you have people of my generation who are displaced from their factory jobs, and people of their children's generation and below who wanted different opportunities, it was mainly uh, career technical training and community colleges who are connecting them with these highly paid skilled jobs that actually exist and where, where there's a lot of demand. They're different from the jobs that are going, but that's, that's been the, the long story of, of our, our country. Um, so I'm, I'm saying uh, public in the middle, career technical and community colleges, and I guess um, I would say just some general uh, an end to such bad mouthing about education. You know, it, that, that it is a better unifying thing than we think, and most people recognize that about their own communities. And I guess if they didn't imagine their successes locally were these anomalies. Um, so anyhow, that, that's my non-expert view. Mm -hmm. What about you? You want my three? Uh -huh. yes. I'm so glad that you <laughs> got him first because they gave me a chance to think. He's yeah. too fast. First of all, I want you all to know, since I'm a dean, I'm, I'm allowed to give homework assignments, right? <laughs> You all should get your hands on the March issue of March 2016 issue of The Atlantic, where Jim and his wife Deb have an essay which essentially describes their visit to these places across the United States. Uh, it is, besides everything else, a brilliant piece of writing, as we're accustomed to from Jim, but it is so relevant to what we are facing now, not just in education, but in the future of this country, that uh, that's my homework assignment. For me, the three things would be, uh, I, and I would say this, I would have said this to either, either party winning this presidential election. One is to get serious about inequality, economic inequality, wealth inequality in the United States and its effect on educational opportunity. And uh, what we have allowed to happen in the economy of the United States uh, in terms of the uh, quite outrageous uh, gap between the poor and the rich uh, is something that has long-term and very, very deep uh, impacts on education and on opportunity. So I would emphasize inequality. Yeah. Now, I realize that in the light of the administration that is about to take office, uh, the probability of my ideas being adopted is on the low side, but I'm, you asked for my... The second is another word that starts with uh, I-N, and that would be the word investment. I mean, here, actually, maybe there's some hope because at least the leader of the party that won uh, claims to have made his fortune by being a smart investor. Uh, let's see some of that investment mentality when it comes to education, by which I mean not just investing in the ideas that the private sector can handle it all, but investing public service, public resources in the service of what is a public good. Uh, that's going to take a little bit of uh, lobbying, let's just say, with this group. But I still think that would be my second thing. And the third is another word that starts with IN, and that's inclusion. And for that, I think, again, the American experience and the American experiment in universal education and in access and in expanding the franchise. Um, I was telling some of my faculty earlier today, pretty soon I'm going to be starting to wear a lapel pin with the Statue of Liberty. And I'm not kidding. And I think the idea of American education as being inclusive, and I don't mean it in, you know, in the rather more jargony way in which that, even that word has been hijacked, but the idea of inclusion in the American experiment in education, people of color, people with, uh, who come from different countries, people with disabilities, people with different uh, gender and, and sexual preferences and all the rest, that's what made America great, and that's what needs to continue to make America great. And now it's just a matter of um, if anybody over there picks up the phone, I will be glad to tell them that. <laughs> um, well, let's go ahead and take some questions. If anyone has questions, please come to the mic. And if someone's coming to the mic, yes. I'll, I'll give a 10-second addition to what, what uh, Michael mm -hmm. was saying. That, that I'm about to write the story of Erie, Pennsylvania, with the cruelest kind of funding inequality you, you can imagine. And that, that it just that mm -hmm. it, it, people that are trying so hard, but just the rules of the funding in Pennsylvania are so unfair. And that is a story replicated okay. elsewhere. Okay. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, uncertainty and volatility two things that investors typically don't like. But from your view, Mr. Fallows, from 
either middle America schooling or from 36,000 feet up in the air. What, what advice do you have for educators with those two uh, terms? Of, of preparing children to deal with that or of yeah, creating just yourselves? Yeah, just the uncertain yeah. You know, education environment we face under a Trump presidency. <clears throat> Again, you all are much more expert in this th th than I am. I would, the, the, the volatility I actually worry about from this administration is in the realm of, of the judgment calls a president inevitably makes countless times per day. And these are mainly in the foreign policy realm. And, and uh, the 15 second backgrounder here is the main thing I learned about the presidency from working for Jimmy Carter is that the only choices a president gets to make are the impossible ones, because all the other ones get made down the line someplace. And so uh, volatility I worry about is international. And because that depends on his judgment calls, I wouldn't think that on a whim he can change that much in the educational perspective, unless he decides to carry out some of these, um, like getting rid of DACA and starting to expel people. That would be, the, which I think would be horrible for the country for the reasons Michael was saying. But also, that's something I could imagine him doing. But I don't think the funding, it's not subject to his whim in the same way. So I would worry less uh, about that than if I were, say, a soldier in the DMV, uh, DMZ in Korea right now. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Nora Howley. I'm a consultant, which is an evil word here in DC, but I'm also a doctoral student. Um, 30 years ago, I was doing education-based community organizing in one of the kinds of communities that you talk about visiting, Mr. Fallows. And I think one of the hardest things we had to face was that the people who were voting, who we needed to vote these educational spending bills, which are becoming more and more important at the state and local level, didn't see the kids who didn't look like them. These were kids of a different color, a different language. They didn't see those kids as their kids, and as having a, you know, that their community should be investing in them. Given the level of really hateful rhetoric that has come out of this campaign, and given what we've seen in our schools, and yet given that we need states and localities to step it up, what do we do to achieve more of those kinds of places like the ones you described? Yeah. So this obviously is a hard question. I guess the starting point repertorially is that we were surprised by how much existing traction and sense of usness there already was compared with what you would think by listening to the rhetoric. And, and just to give a couple of illustrations again, in, in Dodge City, Kansas, the, the voting, the city barons are still mainly white. Population is now majority Latino. The school district is almost all Latino. But even there, the community sort of pulled together to vote the school bond issue. Something similar happened in Holland, Michigan. Holland, as you might suspect, used to be mainly white Dutch people who are enormous. <laughs> and and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kirk Cousins of the uh, local football team is, is, is from there. Uh, it's now uh, just about majority Latino from agricultural interests. But there, too, they, passed some, they have found a way to think of these people as us. San Bernardino has done something similar in their, their recent votes. And so I guess my point is there is still a sense at places in this country of being able to imagine there is a community of interest that we're all involved in. Um, Erie, Pennsylvania, I mentioned as the other example, Pennsylvania's school funding is a nightmare, as any of you from Pennsylvania know. But the city of Erie is a little tiny island in the middle of suburbs, which are much more prosperous. And the poorer both the residents and the students of Erie City become, the more people go to the suburbs. And there's this downward spiral. But they're trying now to deal that, with that. And all over Erie are signs saying, Erie's children are our children. Mm -hmm. and, and they deserve better. And so, so I guess I don't know the actual how to, but there's still some of the glue left uh, city by city. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Heidi Gibson. I'm a student here at the International Education Program, a grad student. Um, and my question is, uh, sort of revolves around the central, one of the central ideas behind universal education to begin with in the United States was educating students for democratic citizenship. And in light of the recent election, not just the election results, but more you know, the anger we've seen, the distance people feel, the distrust for the government. Are we failing at that? And if we are, or even if we're not, how can we do better? So short answer, are we failing? Yes. This is um, just when I got in DC uh, yesterday, I was on 
I, on the Diane Reem show, which I recommend to all of you to, to listen to, is me, um, Glenn Thrush from Politico, uh, Margaret Sullivan, who used to be a New York Times public editor, and Scotty Nell Hughes of the Trump surrogate team. And the axis of discussion was Ms. Hughes saying again and again, there are no such things as facts anymore. Um, and, and this is it's all a matter of opinion. And I mean, it really, I urge you to, I, I did an item on the Atlantic site, site about this, which sort of highlights the time. And, and I think in our systems of providing the sea in which democratic citizens swim, whether it's education or public media or official journalism, whatever, obviously we've had a very important systems failure. It's one where, just like the 2000 election, 100 things had to go in a certain direction for the result to be what we, we have now, but obviously we need to think about this. My sense is that journalists and entertainment people have a more urgent problem than educators do, because I mean, it's been a more uh, acute failure for, for us. But obviously, education. So it, it, we all have a problem that we all need to think about how to deal with. And I think everybody in the press is thinking, what can we do now? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Mark Snowis. I'm a um, grad student here in secondary education at GW. Um, I also wanted to circle back to your um, comparison with China um, and some of the things both of you had talked about. Um, it just strikes me as someone who's preparing to go into the schools, and I've been spending some time in Northern Virginia, that even in places that are not like Erie, Pennsylvania had been, that are um, trying to do the right thing, schools are swamped. Um, and because of this amazing uh, draw that the country's had, and immigrants have, have come in and are changing the whole dynamic, and teachers are struggling to deal with that, is a comparison with China really the most illustrative, yeah. or should we be comparing ourselves to Western European models? Yeah. But even there, are they struggling with the same problems we are? So, you know, what do we do? No, that, that, that is uh, another very interesting question. And something I wrote when I was living in Japan long ago is that one of the hardest things for Americans to do is to take any other country seriously without being afraid of it. You, know, you, you pay attention to other countries only when you think they're going to, to uh, you know, blow you up or take all your jobs or something. And, and that's why China was, you know, oh, this frightening comparison with Shanghai, when, when actually there is almost nothing in common between Chinese education and ours, the population base they have to deal with, the resources, et cetera, et cetera. And so you're right, it might be more instructive to look at, um, I think probably the two most relevant comparisons would be Canada and Australia in that both of those, like the United States, are invented countries that have committed themselves for a long time to absorbing different cultures, unlike Germany, unlike Hungary, unlike France, where it's something that is done, but in a very different way from the United States. So uh, I spent a lot of time in Australia, less in Canada. But I would think those would be the places whose, whose lessons, pro and con, I would find most interesting in Canada and Australia. Yes, sir. Jim Williams, Department of Education. If each of you were to assume a current services budget for the next four years or 10 years, how would you reallocate the money at the federal, state, and local levels to get the best bang for your buck? I will leave this to the dean. <laughs> <laughs> I, I missed, I'm sorry, I, my hearing isn't great. I, I missed the first if part. If you assumed a current services budget, how would okay. you reallocate the money? So I, this is not an area where I have uh, too much expertise, uh, so I, I'm not going to even try to, to, to fake it on uh, how to allocate these resources. My general predisposition on this, and I think this is actually borne out by some of the historical data, that sustained investments in the uh, allocation of resources toward communities that are relatively disadvantaged does us all a lot of good. And beyond that, it's a matter of uh, the technicalities. Um, but I, I believe that the federal government has to maintain its role in overseeing and monitoring uh, little things like the Civil Rights Act and the, and, the, and the implementation of civil rights law in this country. I think the federal government has to sustain a significant investment 
in research related to the improvement of education, because neither the private sector nor at the state level will there be resources uh, to actually do that at the level that it requires. Uh, and I think the federal government has to continue to provide the nation with a reasonable uh, program of accountability that uh, essentially uh, keeps us focused on you know, steady, even if it's somewhat gradual and frustratingly slow, but, but improvement on the basic uh, uh, goals of education. As far as the services budget, uh, that I'll turn to some of my faculty who study that stuff much more closely. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, I'm so sorry, but we need to wrap up the session because we've got our we final session. We don't need to wrap oh, up. We the don't need to wrap up. We've been given the don't wrap <laughs> sign. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so you can ask Wonderful. a really boring question. <laughs> I'll make it short then. Um, I like your comment about investment and wanting uh, the president-elect to invest, but if he's not paying his taxes or <laughs> feels that's not important, I don't think he's investing in our education. <laughs> um, but my question is, um, what do you see being the largest hurdle for minorities in education with this new um, president in office? What do you think some of those hurdles may be for minorities? And also, um, how can the state and district support students in being able to um, pretty much compensate for some of that? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Are you one of our students here, too? I'm not, actually. I'm a compliance manager for KIPP DC. Oh, great. OK. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, let me suggest that um, on one question that has arisen since the appointment of Betsy DeVos as the secretary, or the uh, impending appointment, uh, that has to do with the relative emphasis on uh, privatization models and on charters and even voucher programs in the campaign uh, Mr. Trump talked about $20 billion to go towards something that sounded like vouchers, but it wasn't, it wasn't quite as coherent as some of the other things that he was describing in, term, in, in sophisticated policy terms. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that this is, this is an example of where uh, I would start to pay close attention to whether this rhetoric of privatization actually does result in fundamental reallocations of resources and an even greater disengagement on the part of the federal government from the prospects of inclusion and, the, uh, and, and uh, for disadvantaged and minority and underrepresented populations. The data about charter schools is very interesting. To summarize it, I would say there's probably as much variance in quality within the charter sector as there is between charter schools as a whole and the traditional public schools. So that should at least give us a sense that this categorization, charters versus the other, is, is a, a bit vulgar and isn't going to advance our agenda. On the other hand, we have pretty good evidence of places that have tried different kinds of charter and voucher programs, and we have seriously good research evidence that shows us what works and what doesn't work. And the basic answer on this, given the administration that we are going to uh, inaugurate in January, is that we have to pay very close attention uh, to the ways in which a word like charters or a word like even vouchers is actually implemented. Mm -hmm. Because it means a lot of things, in, very different things in different places. Mm -hmm. The latest data, the latest really excellent research on charters and private education in America, one of the findings is that even though overall the percentage of kids in charters is only in the 5% range, there is tremendous variability in the extent to which states actually monitor and regulate their charter schools. So if I were, again, to be asked what's a big ticket question that I worry about, it's not the average performance of education in America. It's, the, it's not the mean. It's the variance. And I would love to see any administration, especially at the federal level, sustain its focus on narrowing the variance uh, on the assumption that the mean is going to continue to rise anyway. Does that 
help you a little it's bit? It's so interesting you should bring that up because I remember, you know, DC had a school voucher program. Yeah. And I remember covering a federal um, hearing and there were some um, kids using the vouchers to go to certain schools and were doing great. Their yeah. outcomes were clearly better than they were in the pub traditional public schools. And there were others where I remember, you know, Senator Dick Durbin just going purple in the face because he could not even find information on who was enrolled. Right. And so he sent his staff out to take photographs of the addresses where these kids were supposedly going to school. And some of them were clearly empty storefronts. Mm -hmm. We had them blown up. And, yeah. and so um, it's so interesting you say that. We have time for more questions. So if, if you would like to come to the mic. Um, and I can volunteer a brief additional answer to, to that other question, a, a process point and then, then a theme point. The process point is on educational inequality and I think almost any other issue, we don't assume that the incoming president has very fixed views himself. So it becomes a matter of, of who gets, gets empowered to, to, yeah. to do these things. On, on theme, among the reasons I was not favoring his election is that to me, I say this from living outside the United States uh, for a lot of years, the magic of the United States is precisely its inclusion. Mm -hmm. that, that it is, you know, the, the historic struggle of the United States is the legacy of slavery, but the magic of the United States is including all the different ranges of talents from our own country, from around the world. And so anything that is hostile to that, as I assumed his entire campaign to be, I am, I am sorry to see. And I hope that, that we can locally in our institutions and state by state resist that and, and emphasize what it is that really makes America great again. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Rebecca Sheffield. I do policy research for the American Foundation for the Blind. And I have a background in working in schools and as a, as a specially trained teacher for students who are blind or visually impaired. So I know about professional preparation in this field and I think it applies to teachers in general. Teachers are where um, all of this action takes place. And I worry about, or we are worried about um, personnel preparation and funding for personnel preparation and then the professionalization of our field and making sure that people want to continue to be teachers. Do you think this is um, an area we should be concerned about over the next four years? To, and, and what can we do to continue to support and encourage more people to enter teaching as a profession to, to make all of this happen? Michael, you should take that. Yes. I should. <laughs> you should, you should. <laughs> if someone's thinking of applying, yeah, should they? Yeah. <laughs> um, there has been a rather sustained assault on the quality of the teaching profession in the United States going back decades. Um, some of it, unfortunately, does pick up on the point that we do have some teachers who are not doing a good job and who are not effective, and who should be held accountable. But in that somewhat sweeping overjudgment of the teaching profession, what we have done is played with a very risky, uh, I, with a very risky outcome, which is that uh, people will hesitate about joining the profession. Um, that said, the evidence now suggests that um, actually more teachers, more working teachers today are, uh, answer positively about job satisfaction and, and how they're doing. Uh, a surprising number of teachers actually are not quite as worried about the high stakes accountability movement as some of us watching from the outside may have been. Um, and the problem of teacher preparation by extension is of course one, and now if my, you know, my professional and to some extent personal biases will have to show here, but as the dean of a school of education that is preparing future educators, among other things, uh, the idea that we are not doing a good enough job is something that I take very seriously. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm totally open to a, a sensible program of evaluation and accountability for teachers and teacher preparation where I draw the, my own sort of line in the sand, so to speak, is with metrics and measures and systems that are flawed from the get-go and that are based on the idea of finding fault rather than on promoting professional development and improvement. And that's why I said that the federal government has to, has to sustain a smart 
role in the funding of innovative and useful mechanisms to hold our teachers and our teacher preparation systems accountable. Um, with respect to the, the very special populations that you're dealing with, all I can tell you is this is another example of one of the undersung, I don't know if that's a proper word, but it's unsung and undersung things about American educational history that requires us to all pause and start celebrating. And that is that we have done more on behalf of disabled and, dis and, and children with disabilities of various sorts than almost any other country in the world that I know of. And that's something, again, that if you're worried about that being sustained, you're right. Because that's a national treasure that we should be, we should be um, cultivating, nurturing, and, and reinforcing. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, before I get to your question, yeah. I'm curious, Jim, what you would say. Um, this is a non-education question. But if we had Whew. someone come up to the <laughs> mic and say, I'm thinking about becoming a journalist, should I? What would you say? Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yes, yes. <laughs> this is by far the most interesting way you can spend your life. Being, being a, that it's sort of like deciding to go into sports or acting or music in that it has never through history been a stable or dependable way of making a living, as, uh, and that, that's been the case anyway uh, at any time. But here are the reasons why, if any of you are thinking of becoming journalists rather than teachers or having your students, here are the reasons. Um, number one, it is just the most interesting thing you can do because you go into other people's lives at sort of finite intervals. I was in a Chinese coal mine for a while, but then I was not in a Chinese coal mine anymore. I could do I learn about other things, and, and so it, it is interesting. Second, for young, it's a it's a field traditionally much more shaped by young people than other other fields. Almost every innovation you can think of in journalism, somebody in his or her twenties uh, came up came up with, and that's happening now too. Um, third, if if the students you're talking with like the idea of being sort of tested for performance, if they like the idea of having to take their turn at bat or throw the pass or whatever, whatever sporting metaphor, you have to keep doing it. You have to keep writing the stories, doing the broadcasts. And finally, you can think that if you do your work well, it makes some difference. Mm. The only way we know about places we haven't seen ourselves is because somebody went there and described them for us. And, and so I think that, that it's something, so yes, anybody who wants to be a journalist um, should do so. Great. <laughs> okay, let's get, let's get back to questions. Yes, um, yeah, my name is Katerina Odarchenko, and uh, I'm from Ukraine, uh, work in SIC group, and uh, our company invests uh, some resources and money to educational program which uh, connect with democracy <laughs> development and uh, also with government relations. But, uh, for example, 10 years ago, we have programs with uh, George Washington universities and other American universities when we have period after Orange Revolution and uh, this program were very effective. For now, we have this program, for example, between UK universities and uh, Ukrainian K universities. And uh, people who want to work in journalism, who want to work in political consulting, in government relations, public affairs, they uh, can only um, do education on uh, Coursera and some in international medias, but not in, um, in such discussion like today, for example. Uh, how, uh, in, in your opinion, it's uh, programs of cooperation between, for example, Ukrainian universities and George Washington universities, or it uh, might be a program, a national program of foreign education, because it's also part of ideology of United States. It's my question, thanks. So um, you can ask from the university perspective, or I, I can ask from well, the from, Okay, from the university perspective, if I, I think I understood the, the question about to what extent <laughs> Have we and will we be able to continue to invest in programs that enable our students and students from other countries to work together and learn together and find mutually reinforcing? Is that, that, is that a, an adequate summary? Um, this remains a very high priority. I can only speak about GW. It remains a high priority for us, and we are a little bit concerned uh, in the light of some of the campaign rhetoric uh, about <laughs> Uh, shall we say, the inclusion and the immigration and, and the other that came up in this campaign, uh, whether this will somehow discourage students from overseas uh, from thinking about coming to study here. Now, that's, that's got all kinds of 
Again, this is speculative at this point. We don't really know. I'm hoping that people understand uh, in other countries that the university, independent of whatever the administration's point of view might be about this, that the university maintains a very abiding commitment to the ideals of cross-national collaboration and international uh, engagement. Um, and uh, one can only hope that 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 continues to be uh, one of, one of the, the, the great things about being in a big university in this country is that we have this, um, we have this uh, wonderful hodgepodge of uh, people from all over the place. And I find that to be one of the most thrilling things to be uh, about this university is if I'm sitting in a restaurant at the corner of 20, 21st and Pennsylvania, I hear all kinds of languages just during lunch, and some of it is from students, and some of it's from faculty, and some of it, by the way, is from people who wander over from the World Bank. So it's not only that. I mean, geographically, we have that additional advantage, and uh, I just hope that we find ways to sustain that, uh, and that people overseas shouldn't, uh, shouldn't worry too much about it yet. So, so a, a, one of the rare advantages of being as old as I now am is I've been able to see over the generations the difference it makes, exchanges like you're talking about, just the, the effect it has on Americans of having lived in Europe or Africa or South America or wherever, and the effect it has around the world of people having spent time in the United States or even been connected online, as you say, of some of the courses. So I'm in favor of, I, I will do everything I can to fight for the continuation of these exchanges, because I think they're just, um, not every one of them goes perfectly, but they really matter on both sides and make the world a lot more stable place than it would be otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things about being an education reporter is that everyone has an opinion about how public schools should be run because they've gone to public schools themselves. And now we have a situation where the education secretary has not gone to public school herself, and her children have not gone to public school. Do you think this is going to be like you know, public schools under assault, or is this, could this be an opportunity for a breath of fresh air, you know, let someone with a totally different perspective? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, this is, um, this is perhaps like having a commander in chief whose, whose public service was, was military high school. That, that is uh, also, so, so um, Let's look on the bright side. That's, that's my answer. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, I, 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 I mean, looking on the bright side is, uh, this is more and more a, a challenge. But yes, I, I think we need to look on the bright side here. And um, there, are, there are reasons to worry about uh, these kinds of questions that are coming up and about whether a secretary of education who has had very limited personal experience in, in public schools uh, will have what it takes to, to lead an, a, a large existing bureaucracy dedicated to the improvement of public education. Uh, that said, we've had other secretaries of education who have had very limited experience in higher education, for example, but who've done really well. And they've surrounded themselves by people and they've kept an open mind and they have had an appetite for, you know, for advice and for and for things, and on that, truly, I don't yet have enough data to know whether, uh, what, what to say about it. I just think we should all, as a community, be willing to proactively provide uh, advice, because even if they don't ask, <laughs> we should be putting it out there. So I, 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 a fact on, on the, the business of, of, of cabinet selections, which is interesting. So when the George W. Bush cabinet was assembled now 16 years ago, there was some article in the Post saying that this was a, a cabinet of, of multimillionaires. And someone calculated today that if you took oh, all yeah. of the assets of all the cabinet members together, they were one-tenth the holdings of the man of, proposed for Secretary of Commerce now. So this is a whole different, um, whole different level, but we'll try to look for ways to, to be inclusive and provide advice. Yeah. <laughs> and on this, I think one has to be cautious also, because I know it's fashionable to look at the concentration of wealth and to blame Wall Street for all of the ills in this country. On the other hand, uh, there are people who have made great fortunes who have turned around and done spectacularly good things for our country. And I think we shouldn't yes. lose sight of the fact that just because somebody happens to be 
a mega billionaire, that that person right. is necessarily suspect. Now, there are other, <laughs> there may be other evidence to, to yes. bring into this yes. equation. But again, uh, looking for the bright side, yes, I, I will agree. I, uh, you know, if it weren't for Bill Gates putting $50 million down in a single quick check, we'd still be arguing in the federal bureaucracy about how to combat the Ebola crisis. Yeah. And this is an example of concentrated wealth to the public good. Whether Mr. Mnuchin has those instincts, I don't know. Whether Wilbur Ross has those instincts, I really don't know. We'll but hopeful. surprising things happen when people have positions of high authority sometimes. Hi. I know, oh, dear. This is a very complicated system, this microphone. Um, Elizabeth Rich from Education Week. This is a question for you, Michael. And it can be a yes, no answer. As somebody who heads a private institution that deals with a large public bureaucracy, I'm wondering going forward if you've been thinking at all about adjustments in your program, given the fact that we're in for, I mean, whatever, we're about to enter a, a different kind of experience for at least four years. So I'll, I'll give one rather slightly flip answer to the question about uh, what it's like to be living in a country where approximately half the people think higher education is too expensive and doesn't pay off, and the other half think that schools of education are in particular the problem. So I'm running a school of education in an expensive private university, and sometimes I wonder, maybe I should have stayed in journalism, something. <laughs> Okay, but now the serious answer. Yes, we are already giving serious consideration to adjustments in our regular curriculum and in our regular programs of research and engagement that can get to some of the issues that have arisen because of the campaign and because of the outcome. That said, we are sustaining our commitment to being an organization devoted to scholarship and independence and objective analysis of data and I believe that issues of civic society, the role of government, the importance of academic freedom, that those are issues that I want us to pay even more attention to. This, the whole pro set of problems related to inequality in American society and its effects on education, those are all issues that we were already working on and now we think even more we've got to double down on some of, on some of those issues. What will be the effect of this administration on the management and financing and long-term enrollment prospects for the George Washington University? Way too early to tell. I actually think we'll be pretty much okay. I worry more about schools where there is a much higher reliance on federal financial aid because some of that seems to be at play, at least rhetorically. Um, but yeah, we're, we are a graduate school of education quite committed to the ideals of putting research knowledge into the service of improved practice and policy, number one, and number two, with an abiding commitment to furthering the agenda of, of enhanced opportunity, especially for underrepresented and disadvantaged youth. So on those matters, we've got, we've got an interesting few years ahead. I am looking to Mike, uh, <laughs> Matthew to see how we're doing on time. Uh, we are apparently um, I think turning this into a, um, an all-nighter. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's because our, our next guest is in transit, right? Yes. Yeah. And, yes. And so I, so I, will, I, I have not meant to sound as sort of politically, um, I didn't intend to talk as much about politics as I have, so I, I'm sorry if I have I'll let it, uh, offended anybody with that. I'm happy mainly to talk about China or the texture of the country, which is promising. And you all are helping create, so thank you. <laughs> Uh, Can I just say one thing, Matthew? I just want to say one thing, Matthew. Yes, please. What a, what a great honor it is for me to share the stage with Jim Fallows. And yes. now I'm talking as a GW guy. Absolutely. I'm honored to be You should know this is very, very special. And he came back from Shanghai just 30 hours, not even 20 hours ago or 10 hours ago, and has agreed to be with us. And thank you so much. I'm still deluded, but thank you all. So thanks for the questions. <laughs> so we have two mics. Uh, yeah, so people are talking about what I'm trying to talk. Sorry, guys. Um, OK, so we are, we are, the eagle has landed. Excellent, yes. So for those on the live stream who are wondering who that might be. Um, yes, so um, 
It right. turns out we, have, we are micing them up in the lobby, and they will be up on stage in two minutes, maybe one minute at this rate. Thank you so much for your time on stage, James. Please tell us, please uh, for us. No, please, you've got two minutes, please. <laughs> so, so gift giving time is here. A subscription to The Atlantic makes the perfect gift. So it is all ages. <laughs> And Edwig, too, of course. <laughs> I was going to say yes. I absolutely have to plug Edwig. <laughs> OK, I think our next guest is yeah. here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'd be remiss Thank in you. saying uh, if you, you should all just be sure to get a group online subscription as well here at the end. Uh, just let your dean of education know we're ready to serve. Education week is yours for the price. Uh, please uh, welcome to the stage Allison Klein and Cecilia Munoz. Uh, yeah, the stairs are right over here. Yeah, and we will begin momentarily, everybody. First of all, I want to thank everybody here for sticking around. Thank you. I'm um, so sorry. Yeah, we have a treat at, at the very end of our presentation. Um, Cecilia Munoz, who's the director of the White House Domestic Policy Council under President Obama. So she's about to finally catch up on, on what, eight years of sleep? Or <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, So I'm going to start out asking the question that I'm guessing everybody must have on their mind. You're about to hand over the reins of your education legacy to Donald Trump and his team. How nervous are you <laughs> that they are going to reverse all of the initiatives that you've built over the past eight years? Um, so first of all, I apologize profusely for being there. Oh, no, no, no. Just to let you know, it's a parking lot out there, yeah. just to be forewarned. Um, so as the president has said, it's, it's incredibly important that we honor the process of a, 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 of a smooth transition. If we benefited. Uh, when I was part of the transition. I actually yeah. started the day after the President Obama's inauguration. We benefited tremendously from the fact that the Bush administration did a generous and thoughtful and professional job at handing over the reins, and we're doing the same thing. Uh, that's a, it, it's a hallmark of our democracy, and we're really actually very proud of that. Um, and on the set of education issues of which we are incredibly proud of the yeah. accomplishments, Look, I think there are incredibly important benchmarks that are not controversial, that are not the subject really of partisan wrangling. In fact, with, we passed bipartisan legislation on education reform a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, and we expect to be, um, uh, to be held accountable by the American people on the kinds of indicators that, uh, that we've been talking about, like what happens to the graduation rate. It has been going up. What happens to the lowest performing schools? The number of dropout factories has dropped in half. Um, so the, the trend lines are moving in a good direction. And ultimately, that is something that the American people support. And that's something that, the, that uh, players on both sides of the aisle are interested in achieving. So at the end of the day, I think that, that um, those measures are clear. And the American people have a right to expect of any administration that they move the trend lines in the right direction. And you know, we, we certainly hope that our successors will, will be successful in moving those trend lines in the right direction, because that's, that's why we're here. That's the point of running an education policy. Yeah, I know I hear that. Um, in my reporting, um, I know you're from the civil rights community. Mm -hmm. um, and I've talked to a number of people in that community who are really worried um, about how poor kids, students of color, students in special education and English learners are going to fare under a Trump administration just because of some of the rhetoric they heard on the campaign trail. I know that this has been, that those students have been um, really important to President Obama, it's something that he talks about a lot, certainly something that we hear um, Secretary John King talk about a lot. Mm -hmm. From what you've seen, do you think that President-elect Trump shares their beliefs in educational equity? So I think the country shares our beliefs in educational equity. The, the point, so the President and the First Lady have been focused on this from the very beginning. They are the beneficiaries of the fact that we make investments in our kids and in, in all kids. And they've, they're very upfront about this, that they are the products of an educational system that, among other things, uh, provided them support in getting to higher education and in being successful. And they are the first to say that they are where they are because of uh, access to a quality education. And since the very first moment, They've been focused on making sure that's available to everyone in the country. That, that, that's our job. And it's not just our job because we are an altruistic and generous nation. It's our job because if our economy is going to be successful, we have to make sure that we are 
uh, preparing people for college and career. So all of the, the big achievements, the fact that 49 states have now adopted standards that um, uh, that make sure that students are, are ready for college and career, the fact that, um, again, that we're turning around the lowest performing schools, that we're having those kinds of successes, that we've connected 20 million more students to broadband in their classrooms. That's all um, uh, aiming at the goal of making sure that we bring high quality education, that we make that available to every student. And importantly, the goals of accountability, the goals of supporting teachers, the goals of using uh, metrics to measure ourselves, are, they've been our hallmarks of our administration's work, but they're also enshrined in the Every Student Succeeds Act. Yeah. And again, that's a bipartisan piece of legislation. These are, and you know, hopefully when we're at our best, the notion of making sure every kid in this country is successful is not the subject of partisan wrangling. How to get there? There's a debate about how to get there. And that debate, ultimately, we saw that debate in the legislative conversation over the Every Student Succeeds Act. We're, frankly, we're seeing that debate in the conversation over the regulations that we're putting forward on that act. But I don't think there is a debate on the goal. So you mentioned um, broadband. And I know that was one of your initiatives to help connect rural America, in part, um, to the internet. You've had other initiatives for rural America, mm -hmm. like career and technical education. Um, but obviously, you know, Mr. Trump did really well in those areas. Um, so what more can be done for rural schools? What would, what would you like to see the next administration do? Do you feel like you all did enough for those schools? So we actually, so I, in my role in uh, domestic policy, one of the things that um, I help lead and staff is something called the Rural Council, where we actually have a bunch of uh, federal agencies, including the Department of Education, working with the Department of Agriculture and focusing on what we call multi-generational strategies to support people in rural communities, meaning that we're not just focusing on the kids on one set of programs and on parents in another set of programs, but that we're actually focusing on what's happening in multiple generations. Um, and that's actually been quite fruitful um, in making sure we're directing resources and that we're actually making progress. But some of our investments in things like innovation um, have really benefited rural communities. So there's, for example, um, uh, through our I3 grants, a project focused on writing, which is supporting teachers and helping students be good critical thinkers and good writers. That's reaching tens of thousands of students uh, and teachers in rural America. Um, so again, we're, we're making good on the notion that we have to reach every student in every corner of the country. And the investments that we're making in innovation are one of the ways that we do that. The investments that we're making in uh, individualized learning, again, are, are among the tools that help us accomplish that. Um, so I've heard throughout Mr. Obama's presidency that education is one of his favorite issues. Can you tell me how involved does he get in kind of the wonky, weedsy details that we write about so often at Education Week? He's really involved. Yeah. 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 Can you tell us a story that maybe we, something that we wouldn't know? Um, yeah, this is actually takes us into the, into the higher education realm. So again, from the very first moment, He's been very deeply engaged. And you know, our education works covers the whole span from early childhood education through K-12 and higher education. Um, uh, he, when I, so I became the domestic policy director in 2012. And he asked the team, he basically said, look, we're in a tough budget environment. I'm really focused on inequality and on kicking the doors of opportunity open. I want to know where we get the best bang for our buck in addressing opportunity and inequality. And we spent. The whole team spent months answering that question. Anything was on the table. And the answer we came back with was early childhood education. And that's from, it's from there that you get his proposal to make uh, pre -K, high quality pre-K available to every four-year-old in this country. We figured out how to do it. We figured out how to pay for it. As a result of the work, while Congress didn't uh, do what we would have liked them to do to get that done, we did make progress in 34 states. We've expanded the number of pre-K slots. We've expanded the quality. Uh, and the, the um, number of investments that are being made by states all, all over the country. It, the first place he went to after making that announcement was to Georgia, a red state, where, uh, which was, had been really helping lead the charge. Oklahoma is another red state doing the same. Um, so he puts these questions on the table. He immerses himself in the policy details, as you know, from just from his uh, engagements on the issues. He's, he's, not only very immersed in the details, for him it's very personal. Again, because he understands that the impact that this had, that education uh, had on his life and on the First Lady's life. And he's bound and determined, um, again, not just as a matter of altruism or equity, although those things are important, 
as a matter of economic necessity. Right, the goal that he set for being the first in the world again in college attainment by 2020, that's because we don't function well in a global economy unless we accomplish that. So one area where I saw the president's thinking evolve um, has to do with testing. So mm -hmm. in the beginning of your administration, you all pushed teacher evaluation tied in part to test scores mm -hmm. or, or growth in student learning. And by the end, I heard you all saying that you thought that there was too much testing. In fact, the president came out himself and said that in a Facebook video. Can you talk about how the administration's thinking evolved on that issue? Yeah, so it's not, it's, I mean, it is an evolution in that we got more and more sophisticated in the tools that we're able to provide to make sure that, that, we're, that testing is smarter. So it's not that we went from sort of being pro-testing to not testing. Like you need assessments in order to make sure that you're making gains, making sure that you're closing disparities. But it is also true, both things can be true at the same time that you need assessments in order to do your job properly, but, but that the system produces too many of the wrong kinds of tests that we know in lots of districts that there is duplicative testing, that there's too much testing which is filling in the bubble. Um, and so we made investments in the kinds of tests which give the best information to teachers and parents and communities about what students know, what they're able to do, which lend themselves the least to sort of test prep instead of good teaching. So we made those kinds of investments because, again, we think smarter assessments are you know, the way to go to make sure that we're achieving our goals. But at the same time, we put forward a set of tools um, to make sure that we're supporting states and in investing in auditing their testing, um, making sure that, that we're not doing too much of the wrong kind of thing, and in developing the kinds of assessments which really aid teaching and learning. Um, I just want to let everybody know that um, we will have an opportunity for q and I'm going to ask a couple more questions, but if you have questions um, for Cecilia, please line up um, over at the mic. Um, one of the things that I saw you all do at the very beginning of the administration was pour tens of billions of dollars to save teachers' jobs mm -hmm. during the recession. Yes. But state K-12 spending, it still hasn't really bounced up in many states back to those 2008 levels as you're leaving office. Um, and we expect, we continue to expect a tight, at least federal budget environment yep. for education, which we were talking about before. What has that meant for public schools? Yeah, I, I think it's a, an, an enormous challenge. I mean, as you remember, when we came into office, we were in an economic free fall. The economy was shedding mm -hmm. 700,000 jobs a month. Um, and in the Recovery Act, we made, I think it was $60 billion of investments in schools. We um, protected or created about 400,000 teachers' jobs, which is not to say which is not all of the jobs that were, were at stake. And in fact, state and local governments took the biggest hits economically, and that's where we shed a lot of jobs. But we made direct investments, particularly in making sure that we could keep teachers on the job. And those are important investments. But you're right, it's, and not, it's not just limited to K-12. States' investments in higher education are also not where they, frankly, where they should be. Um, and again, it's, it, this is why it's important to put forward markers and to make sure that as we, as a country, implement the, this new K-12 law, as we continue to try to achieve our goals in higher education, making sure that it's affordable, making sure that students are, who uh, go into debt are able to uh, repay their debt, when they, that they're able to complete their educations and repay their debt, that we hold ourselves, that we hold our officials at the federal level, at the state level, at the district level, and for that matter, officials in schools and parents and communities accountable for results, yeah. which is why things like the, um, the civil rights data collection is mm -hmm. really important. We learned, for example, that we were suspending four-year-olds, uh, which doesn't really make sense from a point of view of, uh, of making sure that kids are successful, that they're able to, gra that they're able to graduate ready yeah. for college and career. We know a lot about what's happening with graduation rates. It's not just that they're going up in the aggregate, but in fact, we are closing disparities. The groups that are making the most progress are the groups that had the furthest to go. That kind of information ultimately empowers communities to hold everybody accountable, and that's ultimately the fodder for the conversation we need to be having about investments at the state level as well as the federal level. Okay, great, thank you. It looks like we do have a question. I have plenty more, but please, um so I'm a graduate student at American University, and I was curious to know, some of the other panelists have discussed this, but out of all of the initiatives and sort of progress that the Obama administration has had, what do you hope 
or what do you foresee the Trump administration really focusing on? If there's any core issues that you really hope they'll, con they'll continue, any work that they continue, if you have any like top two or anything like that. Yeah, so I don't know what they're thinking. I don't have any more information really than anybody else does from what you see in the media. But I, um, look, I, we've been able to demonstrate in the last eight years that change is possible, that progress is possible, and that it's possible in some of the places that sort of used to get written off as having intractable problems. So, and the best example of that is here in the District of Columbia, where because of um, assertively adopting reforms, the kinds of reforms that we've been talking about, um, and supporting teachers and, and using data to measure success, uh, the District of Columbia is making greater strides than any other place in the country. Um, and what that tells us is that progress is possible. That, you, that, that by applying these reforms, by applying, by being assertive about accountability, by being assertive about supporting teachers, by using data to measure our progress and being clear-eyed about what is and isn't going well, we can get to a place where we're educating every kid in this country successfully. Um, and, and that, I think, is the most important thing. It's, I think, among the most important lessons of the last eight years that I would hope that anybody uh, you know, following us at any point in our trajectory forward would, um, would take heart in and continue to invest in because we're making progress. And again, anybody, we, we expect to be held um, uh, accountable to, for, the, for what we've produced. And again, I, we, I see a lot of trend lines going in the right direction. Anybody that follows needs to be measured against those standards, our graduation rates continue to go up, our disparities continuing to close. Um, are we continuing to reduce the number of dropout factories? Uh, all of those things are, are things that you have a right to ask us in this administration and that we all have a right to ask of the next one. Thank you. We have a question? Yeah. Hi, I'm Sharon Lynch. I'm a professor at George Washington University. You know, I think one of the things that I've liked most about President Obama, and I think your office has reflected it as well as the Office of Science and Technology Policy, is sort of the nerdy, wonky um, mm -hmm. aspects of the president's personality well, and the fact that he really embraces science and STEM education and some yes. of those things. Um, I'm familiar with the, the movement for the next generation high schools and the very interesting um, education experiments that aren't necessarily charter schools, but could be, mm -hmm. and charter school-like. So I guess looking forward, no, I'll say that differently, looking toward the next administration, um, can you talk about how you might pass on some of those legacies that you've been able to accomplish? I mean, you mentioned broadband and some other kinds of science, STEMI things that probably we need more of, I think, yeah. for everyone in the US. Yeah, it's a great question. And you are right that this is an administration which honors its nerds. We're very proud of that. Um, uh, on broadband and on STEM in particular, um, and you know, because in part we have a Congress which hasn't been as active as we would have liked them to be, we've had to be creative about how we advance some of our um, initiatives. And so in STEM education, for example, we set, the president set this very ambitious goal of 100,000 new teachers in STEM fields. Now, some of that we've been able to uh, advance through the investments that we make at the federal government, but we also got, I think it's 280 different organizations involved in helping accomplish this goal. So that's everybody from school systems themselves to philanthropies to corporations. Uh, we've been tackling every partner we can find to both understand the importance of achieving this goal, but also to roll up their sleeves and be part of achieving that goal. And so we're, we are hopeful that we're on track uh, to, to achieve that goal in both producing more teachers and hopefully creating the kinds of career paths that support and sustain those teachers over time. Um, and, and so we've demonstrated, again, that, that um, it's possible to make progress through additional sets of tools, through uh, building partnerships. So government has a lot to say and do in order to make these things happen. But it's also true that we're more effective when we are um, engaging others in the campaign and the effort. Um, that helps, frankly, expand the buy-in, the fact that there's a wide range of folks working on expanding STEM education, the number of teachers, and uh, the movement for computer science for all, which is something that the president put forward, or free community college. Uh, there are movements around all of these things that we have helped create. That's also true of early childhood education. And this notion that 
we can all be kind of rowing in the same direction and that everybody has a role to play in getting there and a stake in the results, I think is something that we've accomplished and demonstrated that can uh, absolutely and should absolutely continue. Looks like we have another question. Hello, I'm Bobby Pedrick, Director of Special Education from a large school system nearby. I am a lifelong advocate for all struggling students to um, meet with the greatest success they can and to encourage the staff working with them to challenge our students more than we have historically. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, two questions, one, uh, two perspectives. One is, as we move forward, any hope you can offer? Mm -hmm. and, both, and then also, as your team developed work over the past and supported laws, what thought processes you had regarding the fact that we in this country expect 98% or more of our students to perform at the same exact level in the exact same or similar timelines. So I watch students every day who in their classrooms, both disabled English language learners and just simply students who struggle. Um, I watch them be successful with supports and services Right. And then, a, as a culminating event, one time a year, they're tested without those supports, and they fail. Mm -hmm. And then they come back next year and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then we do, different states do different things, bridge projects or such, to get them to the point of graduation. Mm -hmm. So, in a country where we expect, where, where we philosophically say we believe in differentiation, and yet, one time a year, everyone is judged on the same plane. Yeah. What hope do you have for those students? What can we do? And what was the thought process behind NCLB and other legislature that got us to this place? Yeah. So you're right that the pendulum swung too far in one direction. And actually, my colleague Roberto Rodriguez and I were both part of the effort that uh, uh, that past NCLB when we were both at a, a civil rights organization. Uh, the poor man has had to work for me twice uh, <laughs> in two different institutions. Um, the balance that we are trying to strike in the policies and the way that we implement them is somewhere other than what you're describing where everybody's held to the same standard and not necessarily given the supports they need to achieve a, as they are capable. And the other end of the spectrum, which is where we were, which is that certain groups of students and students with disabilities and English language learners were very much among them and very frequently students with last names like mine because we were thought all to be English language learners were left completely out of accountability systems because the assumption was that we couldn't achieve. And as a result, the energy and resources and expertise that went into teaching and expecting success uh, dissipated. Um, and so we were trying to get to a place where school systems were being held accountable for results for those kids. Um, so it is possible, um, and frankly, it is essential to make sure that we're doing that well. That's part of what smart and thoughtful assessments are about. Um, and it's also what making sure that we're um, putting forward the resources to provide um, the kinds of services and supports that students need um, that's what that's about. So we don't want to go back to a place where we have entire school systems essentially ignoring huge groups of kids because the assumption is it's too hard to assess them and may maybe they can't achieve. Um, but we also have to strike a balance between making sure we have expectations for our kids and making sure we're providing the means and the supports for the teachers, for school leaders, and for the students themselves to make sure that they can, that they can get where we need them to be. Uh, but going back to um, to not including them at all is is not an acceptable option. So I'm going to ask. And it looks like we don't have any more audience questions. So I'm going to take moderator's prerogative to ask one last question, sure. um, and then I want to thank um, Cecilia and all of you for joining us. What would you say if you had to pick one thing is the president's greatest accomplishment mm. on education, and what would you bet, or what have you heard from him, is his biggest regret? Wow. Um, it's hard to pick one thing. I'm, I am fiercely proud of, um, of a great deal that we've done. But again, I, going back to something that I already said, this, especially now, I think it is really vital to demonstrate to people in this country that change is possible. 
uh, and achievable and measurable. And we've done that in education in the K-12 system. Actually, we're, we're doing it and we've made enormous progress actually in higher education. Um, I mean, I recognize that it's less the subject of, of today, but the fact that we have five million um, borrowers, student borrowers enrolled in pay as you earn programs that are not paying only 10% of their income in order to pay back their student loans, which makes their loans, their debt affordable and helps them advance their careers. Um, there's a, a whole array of innovations in the higher ed space that I'm very proud of that the president, it was another one of those, he rolled up his sleeves and got into the weeds of the policy making and kept bringing it up. I'm proud of those achievements, although there is much more to do. But in the K-12 system, again, we've demonstrated, we accomplished reforms in the sense that 49 states have college and career ready standards now. If anyone would have said at the beginning, we're gonna do, we're gonna um, establish, get to a point where nearly every state has, stand, has high standards, people would have thought that was uh, uh, crazily and maybe unnecessarily ambitious. And we got there because we put forward incentives that helped states get there and also put forward, created the sense of flexibility that helped every the states get there in their own way. Um, and we ended up passing bipartisan legislation which further enshrined the notion that states need to be helping their students succeed to college and career ready standards in a way which gives states flexibility. That is no small achievement and ultimately is gonna pay enormous dividends for our students and for our country economically over time. But most important, the notion that, uh, you know, it, in school systems that have struggles, in neighborhoods that have schools where students aren't uh, achieving, that that is not inevitable. These are not intractable problems without solutions. That all of this is something that we can address and we know how to do it and we know how to measure it and we can point to places where it's happening. Perhaps that's the greatest accomplishment because that then lays the groundwork for further change. Uh, you know, the president likes to say that you don't, you, you know, you don't reach the full transformation that you seek in eight years. Nobody can. Mm -hmm. But you do the best you can to show the way, to demonstrate the progress, to, demonst to, to demonstrate what works, and then you pass the baton. Uh, and ultimately, especially the way that the new law is structured, it's up to us, not, admin, not government officials, but the citizenry, mm -hmm. to make sure that we continue to make progress, to use the tools that are available on the law, to hold everybody accountable at every level. That's how the system is designed to work. But at the end of the day, that's in our hands. So biggest regret, the second part of the question. Well, so I, uh, you took the moderator's prerogative. I'll take the, the policy advisor's prerogative because <laughs> I work on a variety of issues. Yeah. And my area of expertise is immigration policy. Yeah. It relates to our education system because Absolutely. so many of our kids are in it immigrant families. It definitely does, for sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, we hoped very much to pass an immigration reform. Yeah. We came we could see the finish line yeah. in 2013, yeah. and it didn't happen. And as a result, we have students in our schools living in fear mm -hmm. of, of their own removal or their parents' removal. Yeah. US citizen kids in fear of their parents' removal. And it's pretty hard to be a successful learner with that kind of fear. Um, and I know for a fact that the president greatly regrets that uh, we and the Congress were unable together to get that done. Okay, yeah. Well, thank you so much thank for your you, time. And thanks I really for your appreciate patience. it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your patience. Um, and we really appreciated you coming today. It looks like. I thought that leap deserved a applause. I, I did so well. Uh, thank you so much for your time today and being such troopers. Um, and for those on the live stream, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a terrific opportunity to learn and to find out uh, much of the news and information that Education Week shares every day, uh, but in a live setting. So glad, and we hope you'll be with us again. We plan on doing more of these and hope to bring uh, at least three more of these to you within the next calendar year. See you in 2017.